<laughs> we have a new chairman tonight. Not me. Not you. I didn't sign up for that. Uh, good evening. I'm going to call the uh, <coughs> May 1st uh, planning and zoning meeting to order. Will the clerk do roll call, please? Uh, Chairman Harley is not here. Vice Chairman Margiotta here. Kirk Roberts is here. Mr. Hughes not here. Mr. Oichel here. Mr. Hammer here. Mr. Hamicki is not here. Mr. Dean here. Mr. Allard here. Mr. Edwards here. Ms. Antoniak here. Mr. Silver here. Okay. okay. So we have nine here, so everyone will be voting. Uh, we have two public hearings on the docket tonight. Uh, in terms of the public hearing, um, we'll have the applicant come up first, and then we'll open it up to uh, open comment. When you do come up, uh, please come up to the podium, state your name and address, and spell it for our secretary. Uh, and then after that, we'll allow the applicant to rebut, uh, and then we'll potentially close the hearing tonight uh, and, we'll, and make a decision or continue it. So that's the process for the public hearing. Uh, so now I'm going to call <coughs> 3.1 public hearing, application number 1980-18-Z, Michael Lamore, seeking a special permit in accordance with section 3.6C2 of the Westfield Zoning Regulations for an accessory building, <coughs> 864 square feet, 20 feet in height, larger than permitted in a residential zone at 115 <coughs> Collier Road. Will the applicant please uh, come to the podium? Hello everyone, my name is Michael Lamore. I'm looking to put up a uh, garage space at 115 Collier Road. Um, the purpose of the garage is for, I have a classic vehicle, um, two jet skis on a trailer, and a plow truck, which is all gonna eventually go in the, in the garage space. Um, the reason it's so big is because I need the space for each individual unit. Um, so that's what I'm looking to do. Um, it's just gonna be strictly for personal use. There's no driveway going to the, the garage. Um, we're just gonna, I, I'm gonna use it like twice a year to bring the plow truck out once a, well, once a year, bring the plow truck out, put it back in for the, for the summer. And the same thing with the jet skis, I'll probably bring them out in the spring put them back in the winter kind of thing. So, so that's basically what we're doing. In terms of know. utilities in, in the structure, will it be electrical, any other uh, utilities? In the As structure? of right now, no. Uh, eventually I might try to put electrical in it, but at this point, no. It's just gonna be a, just a empty garage with a, like a concrete floor, basically. I'll open yeah, it up to the commission slab. for any questions. So, Michael, um, yes. you're not going to, the town engineer said something about some impervious material needed. It's a steep slope at the front of the lot, right? It is, yeah, yeah, and so. But once or twice a year, you don't feel any issue with that. No, Anything you mean as far it? as, like, erosion? Is that what yeah, you're erosion about? is what he's concerned with. Yeah, yeah. I think what we're going to try to do is possibly, at the same time, maybe put, like, a drain in to go, you know, into the yard past the, past the garage, I believe. Yeah. We have a lot of water coming down the hill already. Um, I, don't know, I don't know if you're familiar with Collier Road. We weren't until we bought the house, and now we know. <laughs> okay. um, so, I mean, all the neighbors know, everybody knows that it's an issue. The water comes, the water comes down the, the hill, hill. Off, the, off from Clovercrest. And, and that may be what the town engineer is concerned with. I too, think or. probably, and uh, you know, I'm not going to obviously try to, you know, disturb any of that. I mean, I don't know if, if anything. I think maybe it would probably help help it a little bit. Yeah, I think it could. Having yeah. you know, having you something may have there. erosion there at times with the lawn. But, yeah, well, and but and you got and trees in there. I know. There's trees back yeah. there, and the. the the back area. But even on the, your side there, not all the trees like on the other side, but that right. side has few. Yeah, our, our lot has a lot of trees on it as opposed to everybody else. Everybody else, you know, especially our neighbor on the left side has a beautiful lawn, yeah. which I think helps to absorb some of that because yeah. our yard is all moss and it's just like a, 
it's just like a river right over the top of it. So, <laughs> so like I said, hope, we're hoping that by removing some of the trees too, that it will, um, you know, because obviously we have to take some trees down to put but it remember, where it's going to be. But remember, trees absorb moisture to some degree, right? Yeah, I realize that. Yeah, yeah, to some degree. And I, I think, like I said, I, I think um, right now what's back there is not working that well because there's trees and just leaves and stuff yep. back there. You mean way back where, the, way where, back this, where, is the, where this is going to go? You're not taking any trees out from what I can see in the diagrams, right? Uh, we're going to have to take some out in that corner oh, because oh, yeah, that's what I right now that's all tree back there. That whole area oh, okay. is all tree. So I don't know exactly how many. I want to say there's maybe eight to ten trees that have to come down. Okay. So a decent amount. But I, like I said, I don't... The, the neighbor that's next to us seems to have better absorption. Yeah, there's a lot of wood there, of grass. woods, I'd say, but is that part of that neighbor to your right? Uh -huh. I don't I mean, think so. There's a lot so. of trees in there. I don't the think right so. I think I'm not way back in the oh, corner. Oh, you're talking about in the front. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. that whole treed area is our neighbors on the right. Yeah, okay. yeah they have a, a bunch of uh, trees there. Okay. Which, that, that's obviously not going to get touched. That's not our no, no, it wouldn't. It's not yeah. yours. Yeah, no, I understand. Yeah. So, hopefully, hopefully that answered. Well. I think it has. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I How are you going to get it back there? Because the the shed is wider than your yard on either side of the house. Are you? Do you have enough room? Yeah, like there's between there and the neighbor's trees. Or? Yeah, we have a. Um, I think there's at least 18 feet from our. The side of our house, our garage, to the the tree line that's there. Um, so there's plenty of room to, to get through there. Um, and basically, um, we're just going to actually drive on the lawn um, for the two two or three times a year that I drive on it. Um, that's my my plan. Yeah, I mean, that's why I'm not going to do like a, I didn't want to do like a driveway because then. We're going to lose all the whole yard if we do that. You know? Well, is the shed going to be built in the backyard? Yes. No, it's not going to be brought in the backyard? No, it's going, I mean, to, be, that was it's going to have at. to be built back there. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, my, my uncle... Unless you have a helicopter yeah, and you're going no. to catapult it over the house or something. No, my uncle builds post and beam barns, and that's what... Or garages, whatever, you know, what we should call it. Um, and he's going to build it on site, so it's going to be built uh, up there. Yeah, what you, it, won't, it won't be a prefab. Okay. Uh, what's um, what's the topography back where you're putting it? Because the pictures that we've seen show what looks like a substantial foundation or a basement under that one. What are you going to have it sitting on? Oh, um, a concrete slab. Okay. Is it going to be level? Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's going to be all done by, not by me. <laughs> Okay. I'm going to have a contractor come in and do that. Yeah, I just didn't know whether your whole yard was the same. No, angle. actually, that the part where the where the garage is going to go is actually pretty flat, which seems ironic because the rest of the yard and the neighbor's yard is all sloping, but there's almost like a plateau right there. So, I mean, it might be a little bit, you know. Yeah, I mean, the, a people, bit down the people to your right that have the houses the half a mile back, you know, it seems like it's flat up where they have yeah. their house. Is that? Yeah, and that's okay. kind of like our our land is. Okay. Um, so the the backyard that's grass right now that's behind the house is kind of a slant going up. Okay. Um, and then it just kind of like levels off right before the line, before the the neighbor's line. In okay. The back. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Go through what you said at the beginning. You're going to use it for the uh, snow. Well, so I year. so mostly you yeah, know but obviously you got three bays. So what are you yeah, using? Yeah, so you do so I have yard equipment, obviously, yeah, uh, yeah. snow blower. You know, we all um, do. Yeah. little stuff gotcha. like that. The the biggest thing that I need the space for is the, the jet ski trailer. I don't, I don't know if you're familiar oh, with them, oh, but oh, okay. I have it in right now in a ten by twenty garage mm -hmm. space. And I had to squeeze every inch in there because the trailer's so long and the tongue of the trailer sticks out. So it takes up the 24 is the, the depth part of it. Um, and that's going to be just giving me like a, a foot or two in front. And it's also 10 feet wide. So it takes up a lot of room. Mm -hmm. The plow truck obviously 
takes up a lot of room, which I just, that's just for my personal use for the garage. I use it. Okay. Not a commercial. It's not use. a commercial truck or anything. No, it wouldn't. Like you said once. Yeah. Once a year. I just use it, obviously, in the winter time, and then the rest of the summer it just sits. No, so. fine. All set, Michael. Good. That's good. Okay. Good. good. Yeah. Yeah, that was the, like I said, that was the reason for, for as big as it is. And, you know, everybody I talked to, especially my uncle, he said, you know, you, you're always going to kick yourself because you didn't make it a little bit bigger, you know. So he said, make sure you have enough room. So that's what I was looking to do, basically. And it seems like we had enough room back there, so I figured, you know, yeah. it would fit well. Fine. Thanks. Okay. Is, um, you said you're going to be taking down some trees. Is it still going to be screened pretty effectively from the neighbors? Yes. Yeah, there, I, I don't anticipate any problems with the, the neighbor's yards because it's going to be in the, the right corner of the yard. So mm -hmm. what we would do is if we do any kind of a drain, I would drain it towards our yard so that it, if anything, it would, it would affect our yard, but not, not anybody else. That's the no, I meant screened, like oh. visibility, not drained. Sorry. Oh, as far as visibility, to be honest with you, the trees that are there now, uh, in the summertime and when they're blooming, you can't see anything. So I, I don't see any difference in as far as blocking views or anything like that. Of course, you're just looking at the farm anyway. Right. Um, yeah, but I couldn't see your backyard, so I just didn't know whether the yeah. people around you had a clear view of this or not. I think the neighbors on the right with the ranch, the one that's that far back, certainly they can see it as we can see their home. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Um, the neighbor to our left, we do have uh, trees along that property line to the left, so uh, you may see some. And certainly the back clover crest, it is an open area for them, and there is a fence um, that's there. So we're hoping to put a fence in, possibly maybe some trees for blockage since we do have dogs, but that's a not at this time project. Okay. <clears throat> Your name? I'm so oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Michael Lamore? Oh, we Nancy got yours. Lamar. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Sorry. We got yours, Michael. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions um, from that side? No. no. Yes, yes. Um, in the photographs, it looks like there's a hayloft. Will there be a second story? No, there's not going to be a second story. Um, mm -hmm. I was just the yeah. It's not going to be a, a loft per se. There, we might, I might just put a door up there for decoration purposes, right. basically. Um, I don't know, at some point I may put like a plank there just to put some storage above above the vehicle, but that's that's really the only purpose for that. Okay. I just wonder if there's the, a second story. For the height. No, no. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to read two memos into the record, and then we'll open it up to public comment. Um, there is a memo from town engineer uh, Derek Greger dated April 25th that identifies five comments. I, I believe, did you receive those? Yes. You okay yep. with those, those comments? Yeah, and I, and I spoke to him. We kind of re, I, I don't know if you got the updated version of it. Of today? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, some of the stuff we went over. And, and a memo from uh, Peter Gillespie dated April 27th regarding that they comply with all the other zoning requirements. Okay. At this time, if there's no other questions for the, from the commission, I'm going to open it up to public comment. Anyone want to come up to speak on this? Oh, I'm sorry. Gascol Antonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. This is the first time that I see this right here. And, uh, and basically, I just have a few questions. As I see it, it's 24 by 36. It's a big structure. You know, the size, it seems that it's, a, it's like a, a little small house in the back of, uh, of the property. Such a size, what's the, the setback? The side setback and the, and the back setback, I guess, you know, the rear setback. Uh, right now, it's, it's seven feet. I know that for garages, normal garage, whatever I have, like, you know, I have a two-car garage, it's not 20 feet high, you know, it's, it's a little bit less. And I think, like, you know, the minimum setback where I live, it's four feet. This is only seven feet. Again, this, this garage is big. And the question that I have also is that have we given any consideration to the, to the people next door? 
I mean, they have a house and it doesn't show it on the map, but they have a house just like, you know, or the garage of the house is only a few feet away from this, it seems. The question that I have, why build in the garage right in the back? Have we given any consideration again to the, to the people next door? That's very close. If they do need a garage and they're gonna use it for their own, why not put it right in the back of the house? Why so far back? It seems to me, again, it's a burden to be, you know, to, to put this garage closer to the house so they put it away, far away, where they don't really see it on a daily basis. But what about the people around? So I, I just have uh, this question. It's, it's a big, uh, again, it's, uh, it's a big structure. Uh, it uh, oversees, I guess, you know, the, the minimum area. And, and, and the question, again, it's, it's the setback uh, appropriate for seven feet, or does it need to be a little bit more, like, you know, 18 feet with the house, or 16 feet? Thank you. Any other comments on this application? Um, my name is uh, Kathy Stickley, and I'm at 147 Collier Road. Um, my husband and I have been living on Collier Road for the past 15 years. And uh, what brings me here tonight um, are my concerns with this variance request, and they're simple. The first thing is the financial impact. The suppression of future home values when I go to uh, potentially sell my home when I'm ready to retire. Um, exposure to the commercial use of the property. I know that you explained what you were going to use it for, but when you put a plow in front of a truck, it's for business use, not for personal use. Um, in the neighborhood of Collier Road, we currently already have two homes that have accessory buildings on their property. The first one is 31 Collier Road. It's a very large, commercial-like, two-story detached garage. And then on 131 Collier Road, we have in the backyard a lovely view of multiple attached buildings, which I can share some nice photos with you of what we look at outside in our back window. Behind that would be this structure that they are um, here tonight to put, to put up additionally. So currently, both of these accessory building situations are not suited for residential neighborhood setting. We've definitely changed, changed the landscape of the neighborhood before this variance came, came aboard. From the street, it may not grab your eye, but when you go in the backyard, that's what you look at. And it is very different from the street because you're faced, on, across the street, we have a lovely Keisha farm view, but when you go in the backyard, all you look straight down the middle of the yard are these buildings. It's not very pleasant. So to put a third large 20-foot building that can hold up to three vehicles is not conducive to this residential community. And those buildings that I just outlined are in a span of only 10 homes. My second concern is the potential use for, for commercial, commercial use of this property. The size of this accessory building has the potential. While we say today we're not going to use it, for commercial use, it has the potential to be used for commercial use, which could run the gamut of reselling vehicles, refurbishing, renting space for others to store their boats. Put add in the rear reminder, I could earn some money renting your space in the backyard. And with regard to how the garage is going to be accessed, I can just tell you from living in the neighborhood, that ground, it is so damp and it is so wet, it is so moist, you're gonna to have to put some kind of porous product, whether it's gravel or something, because you're not gonna get your tow truck. How much does tow truck weigh? 20,000 pounds? Yeah. And a trailer with two jet skis? Excuse me, ma'am. I'm just gonna say you're gonna have, you're gonna have, you're gonna be challenged. You're gonna be. If you're gonna direct your comments to, to the commission. Sorry. And I, and I do have a, a can you define, what, what is this a picture of? You have the that address? is my neighbor. So that is 131 Collier Road, 147. And two doors down, 131, that's what he has up in the back. Now, if I go two more doors down, I'm going to be looking at a 20-foot building. So when you stand in the middle of it, because all the backyards align, if I stand in the middle of my yard, that is what I look at. So you're asking the neighbors, right, to go and, and say this variance is okay. But in the neighborhood, when you stand in the street and you look across the street to Keisha Farm, it's beautiful. 
I go in my backyard in the evening for a cookout, and I really don't want to look at any more commercial buildings. Um, and with regard to the, the height of the building, um, again, the loft could be put in there, could be used for um, additional living space. So once you give the variance, you really have are limited in, ter in terms of controlling what the homeowner uses it for. So we're a I'm asking, my husband and I and my family are asking that you decline this request um, for the accessory for this variance. Thank you. Thank you. There was one other comment. Yep. Two other. Good evening, uh, Philomena Marinelli, 16 Stonegate Drive. Um, I'm here to uh, reiterate what uh, Mrs. Stickley said, and um, the property right next door to 115 Collier Road is our property at 101 Collier Road. Currently, my uncle lives there, but it is my property. Um, so I'm extremely opposed to having this structure built. Uh, the biggest impact, of course, is the property is adjacent to our home. That home sits way back, as many of you already said. And we will be looking at that structure 24-7. This structure, the size of it is extravagant. I'm not really sure how the board is looking at this, but a 24 by 36 foot structure, almost 1,900 square feet could be another home and you're looking at 20 feet high, you're looking at two structures, and even though the applicant said that they wouldn't be putting anything there and thinking that maybe they'd put a, a window, I'm not really sure why if you were just needed an extra shed to store certain items that you would need it to look pretty with a window. And also the potential of what that second floor could, um, you know, what that could be turned into. Again, as I said, perhaps now they're not thinking that, but it can certainly be turned into something else. Um, the question, again, is it seems like it's personal use, but I would think that eventually maybe there's some intention for commercial use, and you need to really consider that if there's anything commercial use there. Um, and I know they said they wouldn't. They would be going over the their grass, um, not going back there. But maybe eventually they'd be thinking about putting some kind of a driveway that affects our lot because one to one Collier actually is a structure in the back and there's an additional lot in the front that affects us tremendously. Um, I'm also concerned about the property value. You know, eventually I'm going to be looking at that property and deciding if I'm staying there, if my children are going to be there, and I do not want a structure of that size. So I'm concerned about that. I'm concerned about blocking views, um, and again, the square footage of the, of the um, structure, it's greatly going to impact us, greatly going to impact us. I'm uh, worried about the effect of the resale value, again, negative effect. And my question to the applicant is, if it's just storage for a few jet skis and things like snow blowers and, um, you know, your lawn mowers, we store those few items in our garage. Why can't they just extend the back of the garage, open it up, and leave it open for those few items? So I feel like there's potential for something else uh, more grand in the future. Please, I would ask you to really reconsider this application and variance because how greatly it's going to affect us um, as being the most affected neighbor um, because it's going to be on our side and in our view, I'd appreciate your time. Thank you. Great. Excuse Thank me, ma'am. Can I ask a question, please? Oh, yes. Did you say you lived on Stonegate? I live on 16 Stonegate. And you can see across the... No, the property, my uncle, and my uncle lives there currently. My mother just passed away. She was there as well. Okay. But the property is in my you're name. Speaking on their behalf? Where? I, I'm speaking on it, but it's my property. I own the property. And it's where in relation to right the, next door on the right hand side. Oh, where the woods are there. Yes. Yeah. And your concern is you can still see this through those woods? Oh, absolutely. It's not accurate. There's a lot of trees that we've cut down over the years. So even in the summer when the, some trees are flowering and so forth, absolutely you can still see back there. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. 
And just for the record, I want to clarify, and I, there was a 1,900 square foot mentioned, but uh, the applicant here is uh, for 864 square feet, uh, which is uh, above the 850 square feet by right. Uh, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Beth Carwick, K-A-R-W-I-C. <laughs> um, I'm at 118 Clovercrest Road. My husband, Glenn, and I have lived on Clovercrest for the last 15 years. Um, I'd like you to consider uh, this request. It's an enormously large building for um, a residential area. I get everybody has the right to store lawn vehicles and snow equipment into their property, um, but it is a very large um, complex, I'm going to say, to put on a residential piece of property. Um, as being in their backyard, pretty much, um, there are not a lot of trees. I can see that building. I will be able to see it. There's trees. Most of them, there's a lot of brush in the backyard. Um, there's a little wire fence. But there are not blooming trees. There are not arborvitaes. Um, likewise, I'd like to reiterate that it will flood. Um, so maybe the addition of trees, arborvitaes, or something like that, if you were to approve this, should be added to the property. Um, questions I have for the applicant would be, is the storage building going to be put at ground level, or are you going to add a foot of concrete so now it's 21 feet high? Um, I still don't understand why it has to be 20 feet high. If you are not using a second floor and you're just using it as a garage, what is the purpose for adding those two additional feet? Um, also, um, there was comment that the plow equipment would be brought out one time a year. So is it a commercial vehicle or is it for personal use to do his own driveway? I'm just confused as to where it's going to be kept. Is it going to be going back and forth? Um, for the neighbor that's right next door to them, yeah, I, I think that there is going to be damage to that lawn going back and forth because the ground does get soaked. Um, it's just the poor drainage. So um, with that, I, I'm also very concerned with the resale value because I can sit on my deck and I will be able to see that entire building. Um, and I'm not sure that that's what folks will want to look at if they were to purchase my house when I go to resell it. Um, I think they'd rather be looking at trees or some type of scenery. So I'd like you to reconsider. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good evening, everyone. My name is Luigi Gaetani. I live on 101 Collier Road. This, when this instruction building is going to take place, which I find out next to my lot, it's not going to happen. This is a commercial thing that he's trying to put in it. I'm sorry, I completely, I'm, absolutely, I don't want to see that thing going in there. They should never be approved. It tells us that it's going to drive something up there during the winter time in a lawn to bring equipment in back there. These guys are going to go over there and fix cars. And they're going to do all this. This is going to be commercial business. I am so sorry. I am completely against that. And I don't want to see that building next door to my house. Any other comments from the public? Okay. If not, the applicant can come back up. Uh, some of the notes I took down, if you can address some of the commercial use, uh, the height of the building, you know, the 20 foot height versus the 18, maybe the hardship on why you need to go to that additional 20 feet, and I, the additional two feet above the, the 18. I assume that's measured from the ground, uh, which is per our code. And then maybe talk about the uh, if there's any way to screen it. Uh, those, are, those are some of the comments that I heard, but you can rebut those. Okay. Um, as far as the 20 feet height goes, um, the main purpose for that was because when I asked my uncle about building the barn or the garage space, we wanted to do a gambrel roof so that it kind of matches the, the neighborhood and the house that, that's there now. Um, and to do a gambrel roof, we kind of needed the height to, to peak it properly. Um, that was the reason for the 20 feet height. Um, 
as far as you said screen if you can address the commercial use i know i've heard that from, oh. from a couple of us I, I honestly in all honesty i have no desire to use it for commercial use we I, I repair cars for a living. I think everybody probably knows that. Uh, we have a garage here in Weathersfield. Um, I would, I'm certainly not going to put lifts in or anything like that. That's not my intention at all. Um, like I said, I'm just using it. Right now I have, as I was telling you, I have. we live in Newington now. Uh, we have, like I said, I have two, actually three pickups up, as well as a plow truck that are just mine. I, I've kept them for a long time. Some of them are older trucks. Uh, I also have a, a classic car that I want to put in the garage. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm supposed to right, speak this way. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, the uh, and so those are the those are the things that are going to be going in there. Obviously, the the classic vehicle is going to stay in there. Probably, probably rarely going to come out, if at all. Um, so that's one space. Um, and. Uh, like I said, I have no intentions at all of using it for commercial. Our current home in Newington is a one-car garage that's used for storage. It's used for the storage of the winter equipment, summer equipment, whether it's lawn equipment, grilling equipment, that sort of thing. Um, so our cars are in our driveway. Some are uh, like the jet skis. It's a tandem ski. We pay for storage for that. And to be honest, it's something that we are hoping to avoid, which is why the construction of the uh, structure. Uh, in terms of the flooding that happens in the backyard, we understand that, um, and we don't want to get stuck in the mud. Um, so the the equipment that comes out would be at an opportune time. So things like the jet ski, if we take that out for the summer, it, it's out. We're not going to take it out in a muddy day, uh, but a time where it's drivable, and that would come out for several months and then be put back in again. Similar with the plow truck, we would take it out before that winter storm, house it in the current attached garage, and switch the cars. So um, as he said, we have, uh, you have the two, three, four vehicles plus the specialty car with yeah. the equipment that's there. So um, I think he addressed the, the commercial concerns that, you know, the shop is five minutes down the road. We don't need to do work at home. And we didn't want to make, you know, my also my intention was I didn't want to make a mess of the driveway because, you know, like right now where we live in Newington, I have we have a, a small narrow driveway that we shuffle three cars in and out every day because we don't have a place to put them because the garage is used for stuff that I have. I have some big grills, that kind of stuff it takes up a lot of room. Um, those are, like I said, that's also stuff that's going to go in there. Um, you know, if I can get it in there, the ones that I can move in there. Um, so that's, like I said, that's mainly the purpose. Um, I didn't want to clutter the whole driveway with vehicles. The other thing is, I don't know if you're familiar with our driveway, but it's also like a incline. So we can't really park cars at the end because we wouldn't have a transmission left. You <laughs> take it out of park and the thing jerks back. So, um, that's, like I said, that's kind of our purpose. Thank of, uh, you. George. Doing that. Yeah, uh, Mike, um, two of the other things. Um, oh, I'm, I'm going to get off of what you're talking about a yeah, little okay. bit. Um, trees, to screen it. Would you mind putting up some pine trees or some, some evergreen some trees like around it? Or on the sides that would so show? So the left of the our property people? does have evergreens. Uh, Possibly arborvitae, I think that looks nicer than what yeah. we currently That's have the, as the evergreens that either separate along the one. Either property line or yeah, wherever the left, you think the left the side, side is, is tree pretty way. much all the way up. Yeah. But you said you're taking out a lot of them. Those wear are, it those around are not, it, right? Those will not be removed. That's oh, on the okay. left side of the house. Yep. So those are those are actually it's basically like a line of yep. trees okay. right along the line. Um, those were put in obviously by the previous owner. So. We can't really even see our neighbors right to the left um, in the backyard because it's all. And this is 123 there. we're referring to. Okay. Yeah, the, the next door neighbor on the left side, 123. Um, the in the back, I mean, I wouldn't mind putting a couple. Few of them around it. You know, a few of them around it to kind of, okay. if that helps, to kind of. Any any answers on the drainage? Are you you uh, the one thing you can't do is collect water and disperse it on your neighbor's property. Yeah. That's a standard. That I, yeah, that I understand. 
Yeah, it has right now. There, it, there is a drain. Well, not, it's not really a setup drain, but there's a drain between our two properties, um, right on that tree line that I was talking about. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of like a, like a little gully there, which we we both know about. Um, yeah. th actually, the neighbor's the one that pointed it out to us <laughs> yeah. when we moved in. So that's. That's already there. Um, as that drains kind of, sort of down through, and maybe it's it, into it's the more gullied on okay. on the bottom side, you know, like where it's coming down off of. Yeah. Um, like I said, I I would like to kind of try to get some of the water, more water around there, if I can, because uh, we get like a swimming pool in the back yeah. of our yard. Um, but obviously, I wouldn't go towards the neighbors, I would just put it right around the, the edge of the building, the, the, the house. Okay. To try to George, that is comment number five from a town engineer, and you know, if this application, if there's a motion, maybe suggest that the, uh, there should be a stipulation and they work with the town staff to make sure that it's proper drainage and the, the roof leader goes to a basically okay. impervious or Good. pervious surface. So. so that partially helped your answer in law, right? I guess that's my question. The, the comments from the town engineer like comment one is assuming a driveway or requesting a driveway go in. Yeah. So you, you had a meeting with Derek? We didn't have a meeting. I spoke to him on the phone. Okay. Because um, he was at a meeting, actually, so uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't talk to him directly. Um, when I went over the, that we weren't going to put a driveway in, he said to just cancel number one off because it's not going to pertain this, to this situation. Um, the, um, we did I, I don't know make if you a have copy the amended what Version? we addressed as a, his line items and oh. I did receive an email from him today with no additional comments from him. Um, I, was, so, I was just curious if these were like a, a meeting was had and like all these were resolved. Yeah, or, we didn't uh, get this in the memo until Friday, Thursday, oh, Friday yeah. of this past week. So it was kind of a hurry up. So we just kind of, I, that's why I called him on the phone instead of setting up a meeting and um, he's, so we resubmitted that. I don't know if you got the. No, I think we got a memo today. So that, are you saying these comments yeah. have been incorporated? They, they've got notes on the plans. These are all incorporated. So you have a you have a note, yeah. uh, memo dated today, basically saying he's reviewed it, uh, the revised plan, and mm -hmm. as far as he's concerned, it conforms with his April twenty fifth uh, memo. No additional comments to offer at this time. Any other? Uh, Peter, just to clarify, he's, if, if he was at 850 square feet and not 864, he wouldn't need anything from and, us? And 18 feet in height? Yes. So if he cut two feet off the height and a, was it 16, 14, 14 square feet off of, it, it would be just a building permit? The existing garage that's attached to the house doesn't count towards the 850, is that well, right? It's 850 for, uh, it, it's both. There's, there's a maximum of, of 850 square feet for a detached garage and a maximum of 850 in totality. So he's asking for that as well. So, to really d so you have a two car garage now. All right, and I guess just, just to understand, it sounds like what you're saying is you need the 14 extra square feet to be able to fit what you want to fit yeah. in terms of the two extra feet. I think you said it was in order to have a gambrel roof. The and gambrel I guess roof, yeah. My, my, father ha my father actually has the same uh, garage at his house, and his is actually 22 feet um, in height. And <clears throat> so when we were trying to figure it out on paper. Um, he said that, you know, obviously you can make it whatever you want. You just kind of keep pulling it down a little bit. Um, but he felt that it would it would come out better and look nicer if it was a 20, a 20 foot. That and, was the and purpose of it. Is this just all open loft on the second yeah. level? Or there is no second level, I guess. Yeah, there's right? not going to, there, there wouldn't be a second level. Like I said, I might maybe just put like a couple boards up there just to kind of keep Keep a couple things up. That's all. Um, you know, like kayaks, that kind of stuff. We have, have a lot of water equipment for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> and they just seem to collect <laughs> those kind of things. Okay. Do that. What's the What's the square footage of your attached garage? It is twenty four by twenty one. So a little. Yeah.
What's the 16 by 20 behind the garage? I'm sorry? The on the plan, on the plot plan, is a 16 by 20 structure behind the garage? On oh, that's an addition? Okay. Uh, that was actually the reason the that we, because I initially thought of, uh, like, lengthening the garage. That was my initial thought. Um, but obviously it doesn't work with the addition behind it because we would have to, like, I don't know. I don't know how you would do that and build on the back of that, which would be kind of awkward. So, uh, okay. and when when I spoke to Peter initially, I think we had to put it in the back of the property. I think that was kind of so. Yeah, detached structure has to be behind the house. Yeah, yeah. So that was kind of the purpose of just keeping it, trying to keep it out of the out of the way in the corner. That was my idea. That way we could have a yard and kind of clean up the yard a little bit, make it look nice. Any other questions from the commissioner? Or we'll motion to close? I just I just had a question, um, and that's really for for Peter. But um, if a property owner did want did do a business, because some of the some of the residents here are concerned that maybe there'd be some potential commercial activity going on in the backyard. Um, if we were to approve this as a special permit based on the the dimensions of this accessory building, what would happen if, if we found out that that the resident was actually doing commercial business on the side? Our uh, zoning enforcement officer would initiate uh, enforcement action against that. So he is. So this resident would not be allowed to have any kind of commercial activity whatsoever. It's no. two separate. Obviously, we do. Uh, you know. Throughout town, you have issued occasionally, you know, permits for home occupations, but um, I don't recall ever approving a, you know, repair garage in a residential zone in the history of town. So, um, and the applicant has testified that he has no intention of right. running a business here. Or doing any kind of snow plow removal for people. Or anything well, like I would that. like to clarify, we do, he does use the plow truck for the business. So I don't want to get caught with uh, you know a technicality that they do plow the business he also uses it for um, our own families members but we're not you know soliciting we're not businesses we're not to, to plow for that stuff so it's not like uh, it's as if you were just it's not like yeah it's whether you had what regardless of what business you could have been an accountant right. and you'd be doing doing plowing. Plowing. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people have. You know, they own, do need to clear. Thank you for clearing that up. Right, they do and need thank to clear you for the clearing station up for the and across the way. So that is a requirement. I'm not sure if that constitutes commercial plowing or not, but I, we certainly don't want to get no, caught cool. on a technicality with that. I just have one more question. If, let's say, we close the hearing and we start talking about it and it does not get approved because it's 864, are you going to have your uncle design an 850, 18 foot high one? Uh, I just like I don't is, is one going to go in there just one percent smaller? Uh, Could I just ask? I, I assume the permit I, is, was because we were requesting a variance over the 50 square feet. That's so why I'm asking. Even if that's we why were, I'm asking is because like technically, you can have your uncle modify it, do an 850, 18 feet tall, and you don't need us anymore. Well, right? we would still have to. Yeah. Get he the he still needs it because in totality. All of the garage space is over 850 square feet, okay. so right. it's multiple. No, I understood the answer to, to it's multiple things. Yeah. So it's the height, which is and, and the and the square footage for the detached building itself. Okay. But because he already has existing garage space, you basically have a three-car garage rule in total. All right. So whether it's attached to the building or whether it's attached and a detached, okay. he still needs that permission that from you. So, so if he's already 514 in the attached garage, he could only go 336 for a detached without needing a special permit from us. So yeah, saying, exactly. Whatever that, whatever that math is. So, yep. so okay. This is giving 500 square feet extra ish. So it's more than the 20. We, we were talking about 14 square feet and two yeah. feet. That's moot. That's not the. That's not the point anymore. Yeah, you, right. it's. A, it's 528 square feet to be exact, above the 850. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm just a bit uh, confused in terms of the current use of the, of the property. Uh, you're indicating that your primary residence is in Newington? 
mm. and and therefore you do not utilize this this uh, you know th this uh, property for your resident for your personal residential purposes. Uh, at the moment, we just bought the house, so we're we're actually like painting, trying to get the house ready. We're our intent is to sell the house in Newington and live in Weathersfield. That's the purpose. Okay, so your purpose doing. is to make so this we're, your we're primary in the residence. Yeah, we're in the transition right now. Um, we thought it would be easier in the moving process to do it this way rather than... So right now we're holding both houses, but hopefully not for very long. That's not the... The intent is to obviously sell Newington and move to Weathersfield. That's, the, that's our intent. Thank you. Any other questions from the commission? Motion to close. Motion to close, Mr. Chairman. There is a second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any discussion? I mean, if we're, it's just, it's, True, a lot of the things that are being said about how large this is compared to what is what is typical. Um, I think I've had two cord of wood delivered into my backyard, and I have a dry yard, and there were ruts for a couple months before it rose back up, and I don't do that every year. So I mean, I, I don't know. I just I guess I have a couple reservations about that, and aside from that, there's a rear lot uh, right next to where the structure is going. So to say it's in the backyard, it's sort of in there, like right next to their house. So I mean, I guess that's a concern that I have. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as I recall, we need a, a motion on the floor to discuss, to open the matter up for discussion. Would you like to make a motion? Uh, since I'm, I'm, of, I, I'm not sure in terms of my own position on this, I'd rather not at this point in time. <laughs> I'll do a, I'll do a, a positive because we that's the typical of nature, right? right. Yep. yep. So, right. the motion to approve application 198018 z um, 864 square feet, 20 foot high garage according to 3.6 B2, accessory building structure. Um, with the, were there the stipulations for, well no, because everything, all of the comments that the town engineer had were all satisfied, but there was one, there was one comment was some towards discussion the end on the arborvitaes with the screening. Some screening. Working with the town, but potentially again, it's your, it's your motion. Working. So, so applicant will work with the town to uh, provide adequate screening. There is a second. Any other? I'll, okay. I'll second it for purposes of discussion. Correct. <laughs> Great. Discussion? Yeah, I, I have some <clears throat> reservations um, because we have to remember that we are asked, being asked to approve a special permit application. We do have standards for special permit application. And when I listen to the the neighbors and what's the best interest of the community and the other standards. I'm having a little bit of difficulty. When when I first started this discussion, I said you wanted to have a garage in the backyard. It's a little, a little bit larger. However, uh, given the objection of many neighbors, and the, uh, I just find it hard to reconcile that with our special permit um, regulations. And we are empowered to grant a special permit on a certain criteria for a special permit. Not that I want to deny you the use of your property, but I have to look at what the zoning rules are. And that's where I'm having a, um, a problem. I don't know if anybody else shares that view. I, I, would, I would just add to that. I guess I went through the first half of this hearing thinking we were talking about 14 square feet and he could do it as of right if he cut it by 15. And if our regulation talks about 850 total for detached or attached, I think it does it for a reason, and I guess I'm concerned by some of the neighborhood 
comment, and I think 528 feet additional is very substantial, a very substantial building. So I mean, I, I sympathize with the applicant, and I very much appreciate what they want to do, but I am not comfortable with the magnitude of what they're seeking. George. I don't agree with my colleagues right now on the two that spoke, or three here. Um, I don't think this is really that much more than what they could put in, and I don't really believe that it's going to impact the neighborhood or the neighbors that much. He also is going to screen, and I think it's reasonable to allow this to go ahead. Any other discussion? Hearing none, I can go ahead. I'm, I'm of two minds on this, this issue, or this, this application. Um, in one sense, it, it, it appears like it's not unreasonable for them to ask for the waivers that they've been granted, that they've been seeking, uh, simply because there appear to be other um, properties in this neighborhood that, um, you know, that have been granted, uh, you know, the the authority to build accessory structures that that meet max, you know, exceed the the uh, standards and the uh, regulations. Um, on the other hand, it appears as though, th having done that, the neighborhood has awoken to some detrimental aspects of allowing that to to occur and um, you know and allowing those prior approvals. Um, and I'm operating in the assumption that they that there were prior approvals um, uh, doesn't doesn't necessarily set a, a an allowable precedent for this commission's actions and and there does appear to be considerable uh, uh, neighborhood concerns relating to how the size of this this building will uh, affect their own use and enjoyment of their own properties um, you know and so trying to weigh these uh, these two disparate uh, considerations is, is you know, rather difficult for me, and I'm not still at this point not sure how I'm going to, to vote when 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 the chairman calls the question. That's coming up real quick, so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I would just like to ask because I, I made a note about what would be. Uh, I'm sorry. I think we closed the public hearing. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yep. Okay, so I'm just curious, and it's, I, won't, I won't direct this question to, to, to the residents here, but I am a little curious as to how these items, like the, the classic car, the water, the water skis, the snow plow truck, like how is that stored today if the resident right now has a one-car garage in his previous home? You know? I think he mentioned, one of them mentioned okay. that one of those items is stored someplace where they have to pay for it and that they would okay. like to not have to do that anymore. I'm not sure which item it was. Okay, and it doesn't it matter which item, but that's, so right now all the other things are stored. Um, so so my, my thoughts on this, I, you know, I always like to put myself in, in the other person's shoes, right? Whether you're, you're on the abutter property owner or, or you're, you're the, the person uh, with this application. I think when you are used to seeing a certain view in your backyard on both sides of your neighbors, that's what you're used to seeing. And so the thought of something else um, is, it, oh, you know, you think how obnoxious is this going to be? And, and it does seem to me that, that this, um, it's like a three-car garage. It's not a shed. It's a three-car garage. And and it's it is pretty much the size of the of the existing house. Um, the property is over 200 feet deep, so it's a pretty deep property. The width of that of that garage would be about a third of the property. Um, you know, at the same time, people people have stuff, and it seems to me that that 
that this couple is trying to make something nice and they're trying to reduce the, the height of these structures, um, but the width is just based on their needs. Um, I would be curious to see what the residents think if, if this was screened. You know, by screening I mean putting trees up along their property line, tall abravites or something like that, that, that it would still look pretty. Because they're, maybe for some residents they're facing the farm, but you're not facing a beach, you're facing a farm, and maybe, maybe that would be satisfactory for everybody. Um, so those are my thoughts. I, I, I share a lot of the concerns of, as our board members, but I think the biggest thing is the fact that every single resident that came up today was opposed to this idea. And, um, and that's something to think about. Okay. George. I want to talk to Tom a minute about what he said. Um, this is a big lot up there. If you ha have you been up there to see it? I have not. So. You have, well, it is, it's deep. And uh, the lots around it are likewise, and a lot of tree, it's trees in the areas described here tonight. Uh, it's not like where you are. Right. on the Hartford line, where we've put large garages in there, and it gets crowded in, in your area when you put one of these in, or something maybe less than this, but, you know, it gets crowded. I don't think that's going to be the case here, really, even with the three-bay issue. And Sounds like you, you're, you're satisfied that with, hmm, you know, uh, putting in, you know, uh, basically using town staff to impose some landscaping uh, mm, requirements will will resolve the the issue of the yes, uh, of, of the, the the visual impact issues that mm -hmm. the residents or the other neighbors that's exactly have, have why I brought about. it out when they made that point and I thought that would help and, I, I, and green, also you know, I, I would around. keep in mind that I'm I'm not cons I'm not concerned about the uh, issues relating to commercialization that uh, a number of the, re the neighbors have expressed because, uh, you know, the commercial use of the property is going to, you know, require uh, you know, action on the part of the, of the town in terms of enforcement uh, actions or an application for uh, a variance or special use permit uh, from one of the town regulatory bodies. So. I don't really think that, that that's a, a, a consideration to be to have apprehension about. My concern still is that the, the size and our special permit requirements, and I'm not sure that screening with Aprovides is, is necessarily going to change my mind in concerning this. Uh, I certainly would like to, to think that the the applicant could possibly compromise by making this a little bit smaller, perhaps not having the, the loft, uh, reducing the square footage, uh, so bringing it more in line with the neighborhood and the concerns of the neighbors, and he would still have a garage that, that he could use. I think that that hasn't been thought through, that if we made, if it was came in a little bit smaller and didn't have some of the frills uh, that he could still adequately store what he needed to, but be more in compliance with our regulations and have less of opposition from the neighbors. So that's why I'm going to vote against it. Uh, not that I don't want you to have your garage, but I'd like to see this come in a little bit smaller. Any other final comments? All right, by show of hands, all in favor? Two. Two. Uh, all, any opposed? Remaining. So it does not pass. Thank you very much. But you can reapply. Yes. So without absolutely. prejudice. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to call public hearing 3.2, application number 1981-18Z to Borden, Weathersfield, seeking a special permit in accordance with sections 54B1 and 510 uh, at 160, 1160 Seistine Highway. <coughs> Okay. 
Okay, good. Um, more stuff. Thank you. <laughs> you know you've made the big time. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, while we're getting organized for the PowerPoint, uh, I would take this opportunity to uh, confirm the mailing of notices. I'm going to turn the green cards in as well as an affidavit regarding the posting of the sign. Oh, that one's on. <laughs> yeah, that might uh, wings cutting. Well, we can go out there and turn this on. Battery camera clicker. This one? Yeah, it's already plugged in. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Okay. That's the laser, so I don't need this. This is. The That's your clicker. Okay. Can I leave this here? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Oh, all right. There it is. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Turn the lights down a little bit. Yeah. Help. Thank you. For the record. Uh, members of the commission, I'm Peter Alter. I practice law in Glastonbury, and I'm here tonight representing uh, Lexington Partners. Uh, principal is Marty Kenny, who is also present. As part of our presentation, you will hear from uh, Mark Fertucci, who is our traffic engineer of Fuss and O'Neill, um, Matt Kenig, Barton Partners architect, will present the architecture for the proposed project. And Kevin Johnson and Corey Guerra, both of Close <coughs> Jensen and Miller, will uh, also offer information regarding landscaping and, as necessary, uh, questions of engineering. Um, Mr. Chairman, we did receive uh, memos from both Mr. Gillespie uh, and uh, Mr. Gregor and have, an, have had an opportunity to review those. Um, and I did briefly want to touch on some of the items that are contained in those memos um, before moving through a presentation. Um, to, uh, as you'll see in our presentation, uh, we are revising the landscaping around the entire property at 1160. So it is a correct statement that uh, some of the landscaping that currently exists will be eliminated. But as you'll see from Mr. Johnson's plan, it is being substantially enhanced uh, by the activities. The commission may recall that uh, we appeared before you about a year ago on the project at 1178 Silestine Highway, which this 
commission approved uh, and is currently poised to uh, begin demolition of the fun zone building within the next uh, 30 days hopefully and it was at that uh, approval that this commission approved both the shared access drive and associated improvements for both properties as well as the elimination of the 28 parking spaces needed to accommodate that travel lane um, so that those were items that this commission previously acted upon so we're not asking for action with those regard in that regard tonight um, the shared parking arrangement is still in place uh, as we'll report shortly mr. Kenny has now had the opportunity to acquire 1160 Silas Dean so that uh, the negotiation of that shared agreement has gotten a lot easier because he's negotiating with himself to reach an accommodation mm -hmm. um, the imp improvements that uh, were proposed for the 1178 Silas Dean Highway project and the improvements on Mill Street were all previously approved by you uh, and remain in place. We will present uh, a substantial amount of information with respect to the shared parking arrangement. Uh, and we recognize that there will have to be some modifications to the previously approved shared parking agreement. Uh, and obviously, we'll do that and submit it to the town attorney for his review. Mr. Bradley did review the prior agreement and approved it, uh, and so we anticipate no issues in, in that regard. We will be requesting uh, some waivers as provided in your regulation, and we'll review those in detail as part of our presentation. Um, and finally, uh, as indicated in our filings, we did receive uh, approval from OSTA for the 1178 project and one of the conditions of that approval was to provide for uh, the elimination of the southern exit driveway that will be an entrance only um, that's a recent receipt from uh, OSTA and the plans will be adjusted accordingly the north driveway on the Silas Dean Highway remains uh, in south northbound ingress and northbound egress uh, as originally approved. With respect to Mr. Gregor's memo, um, he's correct. Once we eliminated that southern exit, uh, there's an increase of pervious from or a decrease in impervious however you would like to calculate it, of 783 <clears throat> square feet in additional grass uh, with pavement removed. We will, we certainly agree that there'll be a no parking sign at the proposed turnaround at the west end of the expanded parking lot. Um, we will not identify specific parking spaces for specific residents. That was uh, a policy that we, uh, emphasized with 1178 it will remain in effect at 1160 and then um, Mark Fertucci will, will address uh, items four and five as part of his presentation this evening with that uh, those introductory uh, pieces of information uh, I was actually uh, part of the approval team that uh, secured approval for the equity bank building um, back in the 1980s uh, and it was approved uh, for uh, equity bank on the first floor and then offices above uh, and it has served that purpose uh, for that entire time and served it well to remind everyone, a legal intern at that point. <laughs> I wish I was. <laughs> well, I was still. I still had gray hair, and I <laughs> continue to age. Um, you approved the board at 1178 Silasine Highway on June 6, 2017. Just to refresh everybody's recollection, it is the raising and redevelopment of the former Fun Zone site 
into a five-story building with 6,600 square feet of retail space, 108-seat restaurant, 111 residential apartment units, including as residential amenities a clubhouse, a fitness center, a rooftop lounge, concierge patch package system, bicycle sharing, and a dog park. Uh, shared parking was discussed at that approval with 117 spaces on 1160 Silas Dean and 164 on 1178 for a total of 281. Our presentation tonight uh, shows a total of 282 spaces available. That approval on 1178, as I indicated, contemplated making improvements on 1160 to create an access from Mill Street uh, directly to 1178. We also are uh, committed to the widening of Mill Street by two to three feet. Uh, our traffic expert, Mark Fertucci, made that recommendation in order to extend the left, the westbound left turning lane on Mill Street to 175 feet of storage capacity to eliminate um, issues of stacking that, that exist with a shorter uh, leftbound left turning lane as currently exists and as Can I indicated I ask you a question yes at, sir at this point yep. on that. Uh, the new traffic lights that are there now uh, they're going to help with all of that I take it I'm, I'm going to sure what they're doing I'm going to defer to Mr. Vertucci he'll answer he that well I want him to get into that okay he will but but you're shortening the left turn lane no we're lengthening it we're making it longer I mean, on Mill on Street, Mill Street correct left. So that there, there, there will be more room for cars to stack at the light than okay. there are now, than there is now. We're increasing the stacking You're capacity. You're increasing the stack. Yes, sir. Good. Okay. Fine. Yeah, I think you need to. And then, as I indicated, OSTA uh, issued its administrative decision on April 13th, and it required the elimination of the south driveway exit uh, from the 1178 site. So this is the approved board and plan. Uh, we have not eliminated that southbound, the south exit uh, lane, but that will be eliminated on the plan. Um, and as Mr. Gillespie indicated in his uh, memo to you, there are a few minor changes to the 1178 plan, um, none of which affect uh, any aspect of the development as you approved, but uh, came to light as the construction drawings were completed um, by the architects. The Borden, as you'll recall, has a, a very iconic profile on the Silas Dean Highway um, with the retail and restaurant space on the first floor with apartments above. Uh, we think that it specifically speaks to the kind of design called for in the Silas Dean uh, redevelopment program that, that you've adopted. The application tonight is for a special permit with site plan uh, approval for the board at 1160. The current office use uh, will be redeveloped and repurposed with the first floor continuing to be used for both a medical office and a real estate office and the second, third, and fourth floors will be converted into a total of 39 residential apartment units, both studio and one bedroom units, ranging in size from 481 square feet to 898 square feet. In addition to uh, <coughs> the changes within the interior of the building, uh, our architect has come up with what we think is a very clever use of the prior drive-through uh, facility the Webster Bank installed uh, when Equity Bank changed over. Uh, that drive-through area will be repurposed into an outdoor amenity for the residents of both 1160 and the residents of 1178 to use as a gathering place. The paved drive-through that encircles the building will be eliminated, further decreasing the impervious area currently on the site. It will be converted to green space and landscape areas which uh, Kevin will discuss in, in greater detail. We've added a loading space uh, in the uh, corner nearest the, the building and Mill Street in order for residents to be able to have an area 
uh, to access uh, when they load or unload materials. And we've added additional parking spaces uh, nearer to the building on the south side to increase the uh, number of parking spaces uh, available to uh, the residents and added a turnaround uh, as requested by uh, the town engineer. This is uh, for Parker parking vehicles to have an opportunity to make a K-turn and uh, exit that parking aisle. That is the area where uh, the town engineer has suggested that there be a no parking sign, uh, which we certainly uh, can agree to. Uh, would you, you just went through the delivery thing on yes, the sir. corner there, that, and that came up, and I didn't remember you bringing it in before this. And uh, uh, I that, think when we were here a few weeks ago, we had not formalized that that would be. But it sticks into area. the front yard or the side yard. Or well, it's it's, it's really uh, under your regulation. We'll need a waiver from this commission right. in order to have it in this location. Uh, but it, we, we think it's the most appropriate location. It doesn't interfere with other activities within the parking lot. It looks good, except you need it because it sticks into that side yard? We bit. do. The waiver is because the waiver is we're, required, of course, it, it's not permitted your by your regulation you except by waiver. At all, right? I'm sorry? You couldn't move that at all. We, we don't really better. have another good place for it that would serve okay. the, the residents. Um, this plan uh, is also to show you what the area of activity for the site is. The, the yellow bubble is really where all of the redevelopment of 1160 is going to occur. The other activities that are going to occur on that parking lot were already approved by you as part of the 1178 activity. We have no wetlands activity and we have no flood zone activity uh, with this application. The uh, zoning table is going to require one correction. We've reduced the impervious uh, by some 700 square feet by the elimination of that Southern Drive on 1178. Um, everything else is in compliance. You'll note that maximum impervious coverage is allowed at 75% and we're showing 75.3% on 1160. However, at the present time, that's a legally existing non-conforming condition on the site. It's at 83%. Currently, that's what it was developed at when the equity bank was approved and uh, the parking lot was reconfigured uh, at a later date is my understanding. So we are reducing the impervious <coughs> coverage on 1160 from 83 percent down to 75.3, just three-tenths of a percent over what is permitted uh, by the regulation. But again, it's, it's our position that that's a legally existing <coughs> condition and that we're bringing it closer to conformance than, than currently exists. We have 19.8 units per acre, which is un, well under the 25 units per acre permitted by your regulation uh, for the mixed use. And in all other regards, uh, our proposal fully complies with uh, your zoning requirements in the RC zone, uh, with the exception of the waivers that we're going to go into at some length uh, as part of our presentation. Uh, when we made our informal presentation uh, several weeks ago, at least one commissioner asked us to do a, a little more of an in-depth review of the demographics and information of existing apartment complexes. And we had referenced uh, a complex that Mr. Kenny has just completed in Glastonbury known as the Tannery. The Tannery is a redevelopment of an existing mill building and the construction of uh, new units as well on a 30-acre site on New London Turnpike. Um, this was a project that uh, Mr. Kenny undertook and has now completed. It's a development of 250 units. Currently there are 233 of the units 
occupied are 93.2 percent. Oh, correction, <laughs> today it's up to 96 percent. As of today. As of today. The, and this is information that we gather from all of the applications that come in for, for tenants. Uh, average unit income is $122,000. The average, interesting, the range of ages is from literally zero to 80 plus years of age. But um, the predominant, if you look at the pie chart at the bottom, um, the predominant age group that's, that's being serviced is from 26 to 40. 48% 40. of the people occupying uh, these apartments are in that uh, category. A substantial number of the rest of them are people who are uh, what we would consider empty nesters um, looking to downsize. So here is the uh, further demographics of the residents. We have 74% are either single or married without children. One of the questions one of the commissioners had was how many children has that development produced? There are six children in the 240 odd units that are, are already under lease. However, there are an incredible number of pets. The, everybody owns a dog. Uh, there are 78 pets. One of the things that Mr. Kenny has had to do is to build a dog park like he pro has proposed at the Borden uh, over in Glastonbury. If you go there at 5.30 at night, there are literally dozens of people out walking their dogs as they come home from work. It's almost evenly split between male and female tenants. 49% uh, moved from an apartment, 39% moved from a house. This, I think, is of interest because of the, the parking discussions that we've had previously. Of the 233 units. So uh, how many moved from an apartment, did you say? 49% 49? 49 of the residents have moved from an apartment to this, this apartment. apartment. Correct. And um, the, uh, the uh, 39% moved from a house to an apartment, right, in other words, me. downsizing. Let me, let me continue on. This is yeah. important to me. Okay. I knew it would be to the chairman if he were here. He asked for this. Um, the uh, 40 percent <coughs> are existing apartment dwellers, and they're, they're, in other words, they're upgrading. Correct. They, they've Dramatically, significantly. Well, we don't know. So I can't tell you where they that. came from. They might have come from you yeah, know, well, a wherever. penthouse somewhere. but. Now they live at the tannery. Yeah, um, okay. But, but they came from an apartment to this apartment. Correct. 49? 49%. 49%. Wow. And uh, uh, the, the, the most interesting statistic to us is the validation of, of our belief with respect to the demand for parking. Of the 233 occupied units, we have 297 cars attributed to those tenants, or 1.19 parking spaces required uh, per unit. That um, is also consistent with a couple of the parking studies that we submitted as extra information. There was a study done by uh, Hesketh and Associates in Middletown in 2014, which concluded that the Middletown regulation uh, caused a great deal of overparking, that the demand for parking was much less in apartments than previously thought. And we also had a study done by Dutton and Associates for another project in Glastonbury, which reached the same conclusion. Uh, Mark will review some of the uh, information that he has with respect to that parking issue as part of his presentation. Uh, what we're gonna do is work our way through traffic, architecture, and then uh, site landscaping uh, as part of our presentation. Um, the, the first you'll hear from is Mark Fertucci from Fuss and O'Neill, who's our traffic engineer and who has submitted uh, his information. Thanks, Peter. Um, good evening again, uh, Mark Fertucci, Senior Transportation Engineer at Fuss and O'Neill. 
Uh, also a registered professional engineer and a professional traffic operations engineer as well. Uh, we did prepare a traffic and parking impact study update, which was dated April 17th, and also an addendum to that uh, dated April 25th. And um, in uh, your town engineer uh, comments, uh, memo that had come out, I believe, was it today? Um, his comments, number four and five, he had requested that we submit for the record a uh, stamped copy of that uh, traffic and parking impact statement, as well as some backup information from the uh, ULI manual and the um, uh, ITE trip generation manual. And there are some sheets that are uh, included in that uh, as well that Peter just uh, uh, handed out. Um, I want to review with you tonight uh, just the, the, the findings of our um, traffic and parking uh, impact analysis. Uh, we basically, what we did is we uh, reviewed uh, the impact of the proposed change in use uh, at the 1160 property. Uh, so I wanted to talk about traffic first. And uh, the, you know, the existing use on the 1160 uh, parcel is a general uh, office uh, space, 31,200 uh, square feet. And based on industry standard ITE trip generation rates, that would generate 36 vehicle trips um, in the morning and afternoon peak hours, as you can see up in, on the screen there. Now, looking at the what is proposed for the property, um, we have the uh, conversion to 39 residential units for the upper floors. And then on the, uh, the first floor, we still have a mix of general office and medical dental office space. Um, you can see the breakdown of the trips. Uh, basically, um, you end up, if you add all of those together with the conversion to, to residential, we have 26 trips in the morning peak hour and 31 trips in the PM peak hour uh, with a combination of office, medical office, and apartment use. So, if you compare that to the existing use, uh, 26 versus 36, 31 versus 36, we have a net reduction in trips uh, that will be coming from the site. Uh, it's 10 less in the morning peak hour and five less trips in the afternoon peak hour. Um, so basically, um, you know, the findings are, you know, we submitted a traffic impact study when uh, the 1178 application came in about a year ago and we ran analysis um, at uh, the Silas Dean intersections with the site driveway, the Silas Dean intersection with Mill Street. We ran all those numbers. Um, our findings that we had run before are not going to change because our trips are going down. So I just wanted to review with you quickly what those findings were. Um, at the intersection of the Silas Dean and Mill Street, uh, we have acceptable intersection operations. Um, the uh, intersection is operating at a level service B in the morning peak hour and a level service C in the afternoon uh, peak period. And that level of service, again, did not change when we added the traffic from the 1178 and it will not change with the change of use now uh, on 1160 uh, Silas Dean. Um, some of the improvements, uh, P Peter had uh, um, mentioned a bit earlier, um, the state uh, has installed a new traffic signal at Silas Dean and Mill uh, at the intersection there. Um, the new signal um, has left turn phasing for Mill Street. Uh, so that is helping Mill Street operate more efficiently now because uh, it can, more traffic can exit the side street phase having a protected left turn. Before, um, on the westbound approach, if a vehicle was waiting to turn left, he had to wait for uh, the traffic coming from the other side to pass. Now they, they have that protected left turn movement. One of the other things that we had proposed um, as part of our traffic study last year, as Peter mentioned, was the extension of the left turn lane on the Mill Street westbound approach to the traffic signal. We're going to be adding uh, some traffic to that um, with the 1178 project. Uh, so we had proposed uh, a minor widening of Mill Street to extend that left turn lane to 175 feet of storage. So that will allow more uh, vehicles to queue. Um, and we're satisfied with that additional storage that the queue will not extend back to the driveway for um, uh, 1160 Silas Dean Highway. Uh, it's one of the reasons we made that recommendation. 
Uh, moving to the next slide, um, we also analyzed uh, previously the unsignalized intersections, uh, these being the two site driveways on, uh, from the um, 1178 uh, and 1160 properties onto the Silas Dean. They were both proposed as right-in, right-out driveways originally, uh, and then we had submitted an application to the State Traffic Administration, and as part of that review, they requested that we eliminate uh, the right turn out movement from the southerly driveway. Uh, so that'll be a right in only now. And then from the northerly driveway, it will continue to be a right in and a right out movement. So the one change that was made, we had to make to our analysis, is now all the right turns are going out of the northerly driveway. Um, but that, um, was not a substantial volume of traffic. It was only another four cars in the morning peak hour and another 10 cars in the afternoon peak hour. So when we added that traffic, that right turnout movement still operates uh, at an acceptable level service C operation. So we're satisfied that'll, that'll operate well. We have a question from the Yeah, one, one quick question is, sure. when, when was this information gathered? Uh, we had completed traffic counts, uh, I believe it was um, in spring of last year, in 2017. Okay. Yeah, I just didn't know whether, because it says 2018, I thought it was this year, and since Middletown Avenue was closed to through traffic, <laughs> right. these numbers wouldn't make any yeah. sense, because nobody can get yeah. there from here. Yeah, we had counted in 2017, and then okay. knowing that the development would likely get built in 2018, we grew the volumes out a year, and we call it, we analyzed for the, the 2018 condition in the study. Did we, right. know, did we know what the occupancy was of that existing bank building at, in 2017? We did, and um, we actually, as you'll see with the, um, uh, the parking analysis, we factored in the actual occupancy rate into the parking numbers. We had to do a proportional uh, calculation, but. Just, um, I was just curious in terms, because you're, we're assuming, obviously, your numbers have a worst case scenario for it, which is good, conservative. I'm just correct. curious what the yeah. actual, because then we're gonna, we would see probably more people in the building now, not that it's still out of capacity, it's just. Right. I was, I was just curious if it was, if we, if the building was half full and we did our traffic analysis, versus assuming what the building, your numbers assume the building is completely full with your comparisons. Correct, so the, the slide I just showed a few minutes ago, yes. it's, it's the ITE rate, so it's, we assume, you know, full, full build out there. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna move on to the uh, parking uh, study now as well. Uh, so back in June uh, 6 of, 2017, uh, we did obtain an approval um, for sh uh, the shared parking use between the 1178 and the 1160 uh, parcels. Now there was a, um, the, the shared parking study that we did previously was issued uh, back in uh, April of 2017. It was based on the ULI, uh, Urban Land Institute uh, methodology. This is a one industry accepted resource uh, for determining um, parking generation and shared parking uses for developments. So we ran through that analysis and uh, what we determined uh, was that there was a peak shared parking demand on the site uh, of 257 spaces and we were providing a total of 281 at the time so we had 24 uh, excess parking spaces on the site. Um, the, the basic um, tenant of this uh, uh, shared parking analysis, this ULI analysis, is that you have, you have mixed-use developments, um, you'll have uh, maybe some office, some retail, or restaurant and residential like we do in this case. Uh, the thought is that these businesses um, and the residences all generate peak parking demand at different times of the day. So we have some complementary uses office that has a higher parking demand during the afternoon, the residents have a higher parking demand in the middle of the night. So when you go hour by hour throughout the day and calculate the peak demand of each use, um, you can end up getting away with less parking overall on site than what your zoning regulations would uh, require if you looked at them all individually and added them up. Um, so we, uh, we updated that shared parking analysis 
um, based on the proposed change in use to uh, the 1160 Silas Dean Highway. We also um, factored in that one of the retail users on 1178 Silas Dean is going to be a basic uh, 8 or 9, nine to 5 o'clock use, so won't be generating traffic uh, in the early evening hours. Um, so when we updated the analysis um, using, again, those ULI rates, um, we have a peak, uh, the peak demand uh, ended up being around 7 o'clock in the evening. Uh, that was when some of the, the, the retail uses uh, would still be open, the restaurant would be um, in, in a peak period with in the dinner crowd coming in, and then also you have the residences coming back from work um, from the day, and they, and they start to generate more parking demand. So the peak was around 7 o'clock, and that, during that peak we had a demand of 278 spaces um, and again, we're providing a total of 282 on site, so we had an excess of four uh, parking spaces. Um, and again, this is again the ULI methodology. So um, the uh, conclusion of our shared parking analysis there using those rates is that we, we have sufficient parking on site to accommodate um, the parking demand of all the individual uses. Now, we also um, are, are cognizant that this, these ULI rates is a, are urban. Uh, most of them are, are come from urban developments, um, and these urban developments have uh, more. Uh, I guess you could say it's more conservative because a lot of these urban residential developments, you'll have um, people who leave their cars parked. Uh, in spaces for much longer than you would see in a suburban setting like this. You know, they're, um, they're in a city, they're walking, they're using transit, um, they're not getting in and out of their car multiple times of the, of the day. So, so those ULI rates, um, which you can see here on the screen, you know, you can see what I'm talking about with it being conservative. It, it factors, uh, you know, at 5 o'clock in the evening, uh, it, it's telling us that the, the residential uh, parking demand is, is 85% and it goes up to 90% and eventually 97% by 7 o'clock. So it's essentially saying 97% of the people are, are home at 7 o'clock and they're parked. And we don't, we don't see that typically when we look at um, other uh, typical suburban residential developments. Uh, we think that's very conservative. So we went out and we actually counted a couple other um, developments in the area, the village at Weathersfield, which has 294 apartment units, and then also Colonial Arms, which has 69 apartment units. And what we found when we actually counted those other developments is the utilizations were only 29% at 5 o'clock, 44% uh, at 6, and ramping up to about 50% in the 7 to 8 o'clock hour. So it's, it's much, much less conservative than what the ULI data is telling us. Um, so what we went ahead and did is um, we averaged those rates, the ULI rates and the actual counts, and we came up with a um, combined uh, parking utilization rates, which you see in the bottom of the screen up there, 57% um, for 5 o'clock, ramping up to 73 and 74% in the 7 to 8 o'clock hours. Now, I cross-checked those with another source that we use, which is the uh, ITE Institute of Transportation Engineers Parking Generation Manual. They have a trip generation, they also have a parking generation. And the rates, the um, I, uh, utilization rates in the ITE Parking Generation Manual were almost exactly dead on with the hourly rates we have up there on the bottom of the screen. Uh, at 5 o'clock, they had 59% versus our 57. At 6, they were 69% versus our 67. And then ramping up to 75% uh, by 8 o'clock, we have 74 here. So we looked at this a couple different ways and in a couple different sources. And we're, we're very confident that these uh, parking utilization rates are, are, are accurate compared to how uh, residential developments are actually operating in the area today. So for the 8 p.m. are you using 74 percent or the 51 that you measured at the Colonial and Village? We're using the bottom. I, I, I did um, factor in the ULI rates. Um, I averaged them with the actual utilization rates we counted at the, the other two developments. 
but these averages, what I'm saying, is, is actually almost dead on with what the ITE parking generation manual would tell us. So it seems the, you know, the ITE rates seem to be a, kind of our splitting, a, a split, an even split between the, uh, the actual counts that we did and the ULI rates. They, they kind of average together right there in the middle. So I, I'm, I'm very comfortable with those rates, I guess is what I'm, what I'm getting at. Um, another thing I looked at with the ITE is they have an average peak period uh, parking demand. They've, they've gone out and counted about 21 uh, other sites around the country, and they've come up with a peak, average peak parking demand for a suburban apartment complex of 1.23 uh, parking spaces per unit. Um, your regulations, which we base our analysis on, is 1.5 spaces per unit. Uh, so it's telling us that you know your your parking regulations are are conservative based on some of the data uh, that that we're seeing uh, at other similar developments around the country. And one more thing I wanted to note with the IT rates uh, before I move on, um, they also give rates by unit by bedroom, and the 1160 um, uh, proposed residential units they're all. Uh, single bedroom or studio, so they're they're all they all have one bedroom. ITE is telling us the parking uh, generation uh, rate is 0, 0 0.9 spaces per bedroom. So if you look at it that way, you know again, uh, it's further telling us that we're being very conservative in this analysis. Excuse me, could I just your peak is that a weekday? Peak? It is a weekday. Yes. And I guess one one question for the new building where I would assume the bank and the other offices in that building are not going to be operating at least on Sunday and probably for most, if not all, of Saturday. So if you're shifting three floors, 39 units now of people who will be there on Saturday and Sunday, I'm just curious how that meshes with the prior project that was approved, the restaurant and the retail space. And put another way, on Saturday at a 1 o'clock in the afternoon, you know, is that all within those peak percentages still that you're that you just showed us? Right. So uh, it is. You know what we see on on a week weekend. Uh, they do. There is some data data in these manuals on weekend. You see that the um, the residential demand uh, isn't very high and uh, as high on weekends either because people are out and about doing things. But on this chart here on the on the shared uh, shared uh, parking table. Uh, you'll see, you know, in those last two columns, you've got the, the real estate office and the, and the dental office, so they're closed, so all those are basically um, zeroed out there. So, you know, you're not going to have them generating any sort of uh, a parking demand. Again, these, this is for what you're seeing is for a weekday up there, but um, if you were to do a similar for a weekend, you're not going to see any of those last two columns generating a, a parking need, so um, that, that helps on a weekend. Um, but what you're looking at here um, is uh, the straight ULI rates. So this is what I, what I was explaining. Those circled uh, utilization percentages are very conservative uh, for the residential. Um, it shows a peak period uh, or peak parking, shared parking demand of 278 spaces and it's happening again on that second to last row where we have 278 uh, spaces. Uh, and again, we're providing 282. When we redo this uh, for um, the observed utilization rates uh, that I talked about a bit earlier, um, you can see we updated the residential rates for the early evening time period with the uh, actual observed utilizations uh, circled in red, and we, we end up with a peak shared demand now of 256 spaces. Um, so that gives us, again, with our 282 spaces that we're providing, that gives us a buffer um, of 26 spaces uh, that we're over. So just looking at this, again, a different way, um, uh, this is a, a bar chart showing the uh, total number of occupied spaces. Um, the blue is the 1178 uh, building and the green is when you add on 
the uh, parking requirements for 1160. And you can see, again, this first one is the ULI methodology. We get close to the total demand, but not quite there. And then when we use the observed rates, um, you can see we, um, you know, we get up again into the 255 space range, but we still have uh, all that reserve capacity uh, below the dash red line, which is the 282 spaces that we're providing. Uh, and then lastly, uh, this is just a summary of the, of the parking we're providing on the site. Um, on 1160, you're seeing um, you know, the 19 spaces uh, to accommodate the medical office and the office use, uh, 30 spaces to accommodate um, the 39 residential uh, units in 1160, and then the remaining 72 parking spaces on the 1160 parcel become shared spaces uh, for use between the two parcels. And then on 1178, we have um, additional 161 spaces, which are uh, for the uh, 1178 residences, the restaurant, and the, and the retail also on 1178. So all totals up to our 282 spaces, uh, space total. So again, just to um, just want to conclude uh, the findings of our parking study. Uh, and again, we looked at it both ways with the ULI rates. Um, we have an excess of four parking spaces on the site. And when we use the actual observed um, parking demand from the other developments in the area that we counted, um, we come up with an excess of 26 uh, parking spaces on the site. So. We look at it either way, you know, as I said, um, even with the very conservative ULI analysis, our conclusion is that there is um, adequate uh, parking provided on uh, the 1178 and the 1160 parcels combined, uh, such that all of the uses on, the, on both of the properties will have adequate uh, parking during peak demand periods. Do you... Um just quickly, do you have any sense of the demographics of those two apartments that you looked at? You know, do you believe they're comparable to what yours is going to be, or do you know? I, I would have to say they are. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing they are. They're in a similar, you know, similar area. Uh, Marty might be able to have a, have, has a better idea on that, but I mean, these, uh, you know, given that the fact that they're close by, uh, it's a similar, mar they're marketing to a similar uh, demographic and group of people. Um, I, I'd have to assume they're, you know, it's as good, good information as we have to go by uh, to do a comparison. And as Peter had mentioned as well, you know, I, there's, there's a couple of other studies that have been done uh, that I looked at also. Uh, there was one uh, done by Hesketh back in 2014, and he looked at uh, two apartment uh, complexes in Middletown. He looked at one in, I believe the other two were in Bloomfield. Uh, just more evidence of the, of the same sort of thing. You know, he's, he's seeing the residential parking uh, demand rates down <coughs> in the 1 to 1.25 per, per unit range. Uh, and there was also a study done by Dutton and Glastonbury at the Addison Mill, uh, which showed, I believe, uh, they had 1.05 uh, space per unit demand. So. Um, yeah, just, just more, more data to look at, trying to find as much information as I can. Um, and it, it all points to the you know, same conclusion. And you didn't look at the other apartment on the other end of Mill Street where people are parking on the lawn and on the roads? I didn't look at that one, no. Okay. Will the residential parking be uh, posted? The fact that you have a restaurant, say it's as good as Max Fish? Will the residence parking place be uh, posted so that no one will park there during peak hours? No, I don't. We don't have a plan to to sign certain spaces for uh, certain uses. That's funny because I mean, if I, I own a unit or rent a unit, yeah. I show up and there's no parking. I think your restaurant's going to have to think about a, a valet parking to another parking lot. Right. You're getting a lot of complaints. Yeah. A uh, question relative to the utilization for uh, the medical, medical dental office uh, space utilization. Right. Uh, 
the data upon which those assumptions are based in, I guess, the ULI standard that you used? Um, the actual, the, the dental office and the uh, real estate office uh, percentages were actually, when we had done our original study a year ago, we had counted that uh, development. Uh, so we had, had actually counted the actual parking utilization that was occurring on those sites to determine those utilization rates. So that's 2017 data? Correct. Thank you, because my, my concern was that that may, given the changes in uh, the, med the, the way medical services are, are heading uh, in this country, uh, it seems as though the utilization, particularly in suburban areas for medical offices, given the consolidation of hospitals, the suburbanization of many hospitals, hospital services, and the consolidation of you know, uh, of, of doctors' offices into essentially conglomerates of doctors, that that's, that's going to foster a much uh, greater utilization of, you know, uh, of, of time uh, for those physicians, which means more patients being run through those offices, which would then in turn create more demand for the parking. But you know, I don't think that's significant but, you know, even if you doubled the amount that, that, uh, uh, that those offices would be utilized in your proposed development, it would seem like you're still right at, basically right at the, the maximum number. You don't, you don't exceed them, but That's it's right. just a yeah, commentary, I mean, comment, to, uh, an observation that I, that I think may be worth uh, making here. Yeah, I, mean, I think this is, this is a small medical office, about 3,800 square feet. But I mean, even if you took the six per thousand and assumed it was 100 percent, you know, throughout the day, um, you know, you'd be adding 13 spaces. So using that, that the methodology that we um, of, of the actual observed rates that I presented, you'd still have you'd still have. Yeah, and it doesn't really impact limit. upon right. your heaviest time period of utilization, which is in the. You know, basically the, the, the 6 to 8 p.m. time range. Correct. In which case the medical offices are closed. Right. They, they would be closed by 5 or 6 o'clock, I think, is their hours of operation. Commissioner Roberts? Yeah. When you did your shared parking study a year ago, you had peak shared parking demand of 257 and 281 spaces provided. Was that 257 based on the ULI, or was it based on <coughs> the it was, it funky was, math that you're using tonight? It, 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 was, uh, it was based on the uh, ULI, it's strictly on the ULI, okay. correct. And, and at that time, I mean, I think we all remember that you know, there was some concern that there might not be enough parking um, under all circumstances, and one of the stipulations that we imposed at that time was that we review any changes in the commercial tenancy in either building just to make sure that it wasn't going to, you know, blow the blow the assumptions. You know, now that you know using the ULI, you're you're within one Super Bowl party of being overparked, um, and even if you use your observations and so forth, you're, you're basically where you were before. Um, I don't know whether, you know, I just kind of want to raise the subject that we, that we may feel the need to make that same condition again, even though, you know, there are fewer space, you know, fewer spaces attributed to the commercial uses, you know, so that the flexibility seems to have disappeared somewhat in terms of you know, protecting you from your own success. Uh, I don't know if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's, you know, one of the reasons we, we looked at this a different way is because those ULI rates were, you know, they're, they're conservative, and we've, we've pointed that out based on uh, uh, all this other supporting evidence that we found from the other residential developments in the area. So, um, you know, I think in, in going that, that extra effort, looking at the, uh, the ITE manual, looking at the, uh, the other two developments, looking at the four from the Hesketh study, uh, um, we're seeing evidence that the, that the ULI rate, while it's a, you know, it's a good, 
the methodology is, is good, but the actual utilization percentages for the residential is a component of it that is ultra conservative for a suburban style use uh, like this. So um, the uh, rates that we have proposed that factor in the local developments um, is what we're most comfortable with. And as I said, the ITE parking manual rates uh, also uh, would agree with, with that latter methodology. Just, so I'm just, just curious if you've ever done any, similar to what you did with the other two apartment complexes here, have you ever looked at a successful restaurant like you know, Max at Somerset or, or any other one just to see how their real-time parking compares with what you get out of the ITE or the other manual? I, my, yeah. my real question is, can they exceed those numbers if they're highly successful? Right. I, I haven't done a count uh, on one of those. And, I, and it would have to, you know, it depends on the restaurant, too. Some, some generate more than others, de depending on if they're a high turnover or more of a quality style, you know, restaurant. But um, there are studies that have been done, um, which, um, uh, you know, those studies um, are, uh, if you look at the ITE parking generation manual, they do have some data on uh, different types of restaurants. Um, I did not pull and review that data uh, as part of this study, but uh, it's something we could look at. Okay, thank you. Thanks. A couple of uh, points just for the Commission's uh, information. One is that uh, in response to, to Mr. Dean's comment about uh, changing medical practices, uh, Dr. Dolan is the dentist who will occupy that space, and he's on a 10-year lease, so that it's going to be a dental, his dental office for the foreseeable future. Um, so the chance that it would turn into an urgent care clinic is, is zero um, because of his lease. Uh, and, and secondly, uh, Mr. Roberts' suggestion that uh, that condition would continue to apply uh, is perfectly acceptable to Mr. Kenny. Um, the, uh, the, the only other observation I would make is this. No one has a greater interest in making sure that his parking is adequate than does the person investing millions of dollars in developing this site. It doesn't do him any good not to have adequate parking because if people can't park their cars either because they can't find a space or because <coughs> we've completely misjudged this, it, it's to his absolute detriment so that he takes very seriously the study that Mr. Vertucci did to validate that he does have enough parking. It's his investment that is at risk um, if, if Mr. Vertucci is wrong. Uh, we think he's not. The tannery has been a tremendous example of what we're talking about where we have less than 1.2 cars per unit that validates the numbers that we're seeing and gives us a lot of confidence uh, in that regard. Um, our next uh, item for presentation is uh, <coughs> The architecture of 1160 and the changes we proposed. We wanted to refresh everyone's recollection as to the commitment that uh, this commission made uh, on the architectural guidelines and uh, what the objectives and guidelines are that, that we're uh, honoring by the design that you're going to see uh, presented by Matt um, in one minute. The uh, each of the building design guidelines that are spelled out um, in the plan uh, are satisfied. Uh, this is a four-story building, has a contemporary roof uh, with a pediment, with pediments added. There's a contemporary building style with durable building materials um, with neutral colors uh, and an emphasis on uh, welcoming openings, uh, entrances for customers and residents 
um, to utilize. Uh, Matt's going to walk you through his design, and I think, uh, I hope that, that you'll be pleased that uh, the guidelines and objectives that you've set out uh, in this plan are, are being satisfied. Good evening. My name is Matthew Koenig. I'm a principal with Barton Partners, and we are the architect of record for 1178 as well as 1160. Um, I wanted to kind of jump ahead a little bit um, and kind of walk everybody through just how this building functions, because I think it's important in terms of how we approach the, uh, the exterior design of the project. It's, uh, oops, we're going the wrong way, sorry. So if you look at the first floor plan, um, I wanted to just kind of walk you through how the commercial spaces work, also in conjunction with the building entrances and egress components. Um, so I'll come on this side first. Point out. So Silas Dean Highway is along this exposure. Mill Street is along this side. 1178 down at the bottom. This was the former drive through area that Peter discussed. And this is the parking lot in the back. So, one of the, you know, there are three current um, leasable areas. And the brown area is the space that's indicated for the new dental office. And these are two other leasable commercial spaces. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to point out is that the, there was never really a front door to this project. Even though there was an entrance that we are closing in as part of the renovation of this project along Silas Dean, the main entrance to this project was always in the back of the building. And you came through this building on a common hallway that led to all of the different tenant spaces. There were shared bathrooms that came off the lobby. We're not changing those. They're going to stay. There were two egress towers, stair towers on both sides that came out to a common corridor. And those are being maintained as well. So I just wanted to kind of just walk you through that because it's important to know that some of the changes that we made on the facade of the building are to reinforce how the building always functioned. That the back parking lot was really the main entrance and that front canopy and the set of doors on Silas Dean were more of kind of a ceremonial approach. Um, one of the problems architecturally that we had with 1178 is that it's a four-sided building. We don't have the benefit of having a back of the building where we could hide stuff. This entire building is visible from all sides, whether it's Silas Dean, whether it's the parking lot in the back, the retail is double-sided, so you know everybody has a view of, the, of, of all exposures. We have the same problem with 1160. 1160 is also a four-sided building. I'm sure everybody's driven past it many times on Mill Street or Silas Dean, and you know there's brick facades on all four sides. You have canopies on all four sides. Um, you know, very simple building. Um, I'm kind of shocked that it was actually built in the late '80s. It reminds me of something that was probably built in the late '60s or '70s. Um, but you know, for the most part, the building's in pretty decent shape. Um, and that's one of the things that we talked to with the ownership group was that you know we don't have to do a whole lot to this building. Um, but I think when Marty acquired the property, he tasked us with the situation of how do you connect the two projects? He really wanted this to be a community where the two buildings work together. And understanding we had this great opportunity to do the, the fun zone site with a very modern contemporary building, um, we looked for ways that we could combine the two buildings. So I'm gonna jump back now to uh, slide six here. Oops. Nope, I'm going back to slide six. So I just wanted to show the site plan real quick. So on the site plan, um, again, just wanted to kind of reinforce, as Peter talked about, some of the changes that we're proposing. You know, this drive lane that used to go around for the bank um, is being totally eliminated. This whole area is going to be re-landscaped now. So the idea that, you know, somebody could be confused as to the front door of the building come off of Silas Dean, well, this whole area is going to be re-landscaped, and there's a new window going to be placed there. So there really is going to be a transformation along Silas Dean Highway, as well as Mill Street, 
with new green areas, new landscaping, and it'll be pretty apparent that those, <coughs> those canopies and that former ceremonial front door is, is literally gone. Um, so let's jump back to where we were. So these are some of the perspectives that we created to show some subtle ways that we could connect the buildings. Um, you know, we started to um, bring some of the language and some of the architecture from 1178, and we wanted to apply it to the facade of 1160. Um, using some of the metal panels, using some of the um, eyebrow canopies that are at the corners of 1178, um, just kind of a simple gesture on 1160 to help tie the two buildings visually together. Um, but we only did it in strategic spots. We, um, we did it on the Silas Dean Highway side, and we did it on the face of the building, a face of the, the building that actually connects to 1178. So um, we did a more modest approach on the back of the building. So you can see the front west elevation shows the grand um, metal panel approach. And you can see how it kind of connects to the two buildings. Um, and that's on the, um, again, the west elevation. If you take a look at the um, south elevation, which is this guy, where the old drive-through was, um, we have the metal panels that come down to the second floor. Um, we stop them a little bit short. And then you know we're we're repurposing that drive-through area, and that's the, one of the amenity spaces. What that's color going. are those metal panels? I mean, I see two renderings here. Yeah, they look beige in one, and they look yeah. uh, darker in another. So, so. If, if you take a, the 1178 building, oh, I see it a, this way. Say, the 11, 1178 has a combination of gray and tan panels that are on the building. Yeah, these are gray. So it'll be very different from the brown brick that's out there right now. Um, we also have the wood grain, which is kind of showing up as the orange panel. That's our accent panel that's on 1178, and that's also going to be introduced on 1160. So it is a great panel. Um, sometimes with graphics, depending upon the machines, it's, that's why hard. I was it's hard to calibrate it, but they really are gray. Um, and they, it's, it's intended to match the gray that's on 1178. And then what about the remaining uh, parts of the building? So you have the, the gray and the, the brown panels? Right. Is that brick or is that going to be covered? Brick. Everything so that'll else, still be the, the original brick. brick that's on the so building. So you're just trying to maintain. marry that, so to speak, yeah, with the Yeah, other. and then, then if you drive by the building, the, the brick is actually in fairly good shape. Yeah, I mean, good. there's a little bit of reporting that has to be done, but for mm -hmm. the most part, the brick's in good shape, and our intent is just to clean up the facade. And you also took into consideration buildings from Mill Street south to uh, 91. Uh, the other buildings going down through, they, you seem to have picked up some of the themes of those buildings. Well, the brick I, for one thing, and yeah, uh, some I of mean, the paneling uh, and things of that nature. I think about a year ago when we yeah, first presented 1178, on one of the things that I was very surprised about, and I've worked with Marty for about 12 years all over the state of Connecticut, New Haven, Hartford, um, Glastonbury, um, we did a project in um, Bloomfield, um, but when I came to Silas Dean and we were looking at the, the, the Dean up and down, you have every style of architecture yeah. imaginable. The there is no, you know, other than historic Weathersfield, which is wonderful, Silas Dean, you have everything covered. You have every color brick, you have every color metal. But brick you is know. predominant. You do have brick, yeah, there is a lot of brick. And right. some of the panels, yeah. and you right. picked up on both items. Yeah, and I think one of the things too was, you know, we following the zoning code, you know, there was an opportunity to do a contemporary building on the site. So the idea that now Marty is trying to combine these two and really create a community um, with a building that, you know, its original purpose was a, an office building, um, you know, it's an easy conversion to residential. We were just looking for some ways to make it seem like it's a larger community and try to tie the buildings together. Um, done in a very subtle way. It's not screaming 1178. It's, it's a little bit different. Um, we're using similar signage and we're using similar features. Um, which I can kind of show you um, on the, um, jumping ahead here. So this is the outdoor, this is the outdoor amenity area um, that is taking over where we used to have the, uh, the drive-through. And as part of the design of this area, um, we're screening in 
the old drive through the columns for the canopy are going to be maintained. We're going to be adding some brick walls and some fencing. We're also adding some metal panels, which will help screen that area and provide a little bit of privacy. We're also incorporating those same panels on 1178. So visually, there will be a lot of connections between the two buildings. And there's crosswalks that lead between the two buildings through the parking lot areas. So residents, you know, will feel, you know, comfortable because the buildings will be similar. Um, and like Peter said earlier, this is going to be in a shared amenity space. We assume that if you live in 1178, you can go over to this outdoor patio and um, there's an outdoor fireplace, there's some grills being planned there, there's an exterior flat screen TV going into where the old teller window used to be. So it really is kind of, a, like I said, a, an adaptive reuse of the former bank space. Not if there's any questions. Will, let, will 1160 be uh, able to utilize 1178 facilities as well? Yes. And vice versa, I mean, if somebody in 1178 wants to go sunbathe in the Silas D. Yeah, that's what you just said. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, and again, we have a sky deck amenity in 1178, and we also have a fitness center being planned and a theater room. Plus, we have the retail that's at 1178, which is a great amenity for the residents as well. Okay. Okay. Jump back. So jumping up to the typical um, residential floors, what you see in orange in the corners are one bedroom units and then the yellow is representing the studios and then there is a large one bedroom that's planned behind the elevator which is a more traditional one bedroom unit like we have in 1178. There's 13 units per floor for a total of 39 units. Um, the feel and style of these studios is an open floor plan. Um, they're smaller units, uh, but the idea is that we're, you know, trying to, to add, these are some representations of what the exteriors could be. Just very modern, high ceilings, exposed ductwork, um, so it's a little bit edgy. Um, taking advantage of all the windows that 1160 has, which, which are great. Um, but just a couple views of how these uh, smaller studios would lay out. What was the square footage of the units at 1178? So 1178 varies from one bedrooms that are in the um, probably the 720 range to two bedrooms that go up to about 1200 square feet. Okay. And how about in this one? So in this one, the let me go back. The um, larger one bedroom here is 830 square feet. These corner units, I think, are just around like 600 square feet. And then the smaller yellow units are in like anywhere from the 430 to 450 range. Is that I the thought we had a minimum of 600. Not, not in the mixed use regulations. In the SRD zone, you have minimums of 600, but <coughs> they don't apply in a mixed use development. Okay. What are the what are the rents going to be for these? They're going to be similar to on a per square foot basis to uh, the eleven seventy eight building. It's too late to do math. What are the rents going to be? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the studios will will start at twelve hundred and be the twelve to fourteen hundred dollar range. Uh, the one bedrooms will be sixteen to nineteen. Is that similar to the tannery, or is that? A little lower. Okay. It's on here. And I assume these are yearly leased? Is this a year lease? It's a year lease. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's a one year lease. lease. <laughs> it's only small, okay. One year lease. And in the uh, lease, I assume, is there limited to the number of people per studio? Yes. Kevin Johnson describing uh, his plan for uh, the redevelopment of the site with some significant changes to the landscaping. And Kevin and I are also going to review the waivers uh, that we are requesting under your 
regulation. Beg, beg your pardon. Yes, sir. Before we get off the architectural, there is a question I had relating yes, to the architecturals. Uh, if I could have the architect uh, come back to the podium, please. You'd be happy. Thank you. Uh, one of the waivers that have been requested, and I think, deals with uh, height regulations. And it uh, seems to me that uh, uh, the only apparent reason I can see for that uh, variance or th that, uh, that waiver would be for these pediments that are uh, above the, right. the new metal clad uh, uh, sections of the, of the building that are, that are trying to interface and talk to the... Yep. 1178 uh, building design. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, is there, besides, uh, uh, you know, aesthetic, you know, architectural visionary, is there any kind of structural purpose relating to uh, those pediments or their their height, or are they there essentially for you know the visual uh, impact? They they're more for visual impact um, structurally. They're not doing anything um, to enhance the quality of the building. Um, you know, part of the part of the restoration or renovation of this building will be put a new roof on. So while we have the roof off, we have the ability to, to go up and when we when we attach this new facade treatment, um, which is going to be light gauge metal framing with metal panels attached directly to that, it's going to be the same light gauge framing that's going to lay on top of the roof so we can anchor it down into the existing roof structure. So, you know, it's a more of a decorative element. It's not doing anything other than, again, trying to make a visual connection between 1178 and 1160. Okay. Now, if that waiver is not granted, how would you achieve your objectives, you know, and, and still comply with the, the height restriction? Well, I, I, if, if the issue is that we're bumping this up a foot or two above the existing cornice line that's there right now. Um, you know, there's ways that we could drop that canopy. We could tie it into the facade and, and put it down a little bit lower and keep it within the body of the building and still achieve a similar effect. But, yeah, but following what we've done on 1178, um, you know, we wanted to kind of emulate that. That would closely. that would kind of distort the roof line that you're trying to do in terms of matching one, you yeah, know, one building to the other. Architecturally, it would just be a little bit different. It wouldn't be an exact kind of match. And we were trying to be a little bit more literal, um, but that doesn't mean that we couldn't be creative and come up with, you know, alternative ways to do it. I mean, this is our preference. We'd like to do it this way, mm -hmm. but if there's a concern with with overall height, I think 1178 will be taller. Yeah. So 1178 is a five-story building, so it's going to be taller than this building. So again, if there's an issue with height, you're already going taller on 1178. Thank you very much. Sure. Appreciate and I, and I Sorry have, to have interrupted you. No problem. And I had a question also, so thank sure. you for, for bringing because I was going to ask later on. Um, just talking about 1178 for a minute. Right. Um, now that we now will be having a, a brick building, that's going to be tied in with 1178. Has there been any thought to changing any of the architecture on 1178? No, no. Okay. We're, we're sticking with that approval. Because you just love it, and it's the perfect. It's the perfect. <laughs> it's approved. That's what. Okay. <laughs> that's more critical. <laughs> no, that's practical. You're honest. Yeah. That's good. Because um, yeah. what I was wondering um, is that while the wet renderings really give a good idea of what it's going to look like. Um, how would it, how will this look like 30 years down the road? Will this type of facade and um, you know the the whole look? How will, will 30 years later will it be dated? You mentioned something about some buildings like gee, I thought this was in the in the 60s or but it was actually done in the 80s. Will this type of look be the kind of thing we're like oh wow that building was 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 you know was built in the you know do you know where I'm going with that yeah question? no I, I, so I, know I just exactly. wanted to hear your opinion you know uh, the, the firm that I represent um, we do not have one style of architecture that we push 
So when you know we work with clients like Marty who are out there trying to be a little bit different, um, we did the tannery, we also did Windsor Station. Every one of those buildings is different. Yes. So we look at the communities, we look at the objectives, we try to come up with something a little bit unique so that 30 years down the road it won't be like, oh, it's just another apartment building that Lexington Partners built. Everything has a certain look and a feel to it. And when we first were given this opportunity, um, <coughs> working with uh, Peter and um, Megan, you know, they showed us the zoning code. And when you started to read it, it was like, wow, the, 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 they're really crying out for something different here. Mm -hmm. This is an opportunity to do something modern and contemporary. And that's kind of the approach we took. Now that you throw 1160 into the mix, which is a little bit more of a kind of, let's just say traditional office building, you know, trying to meld the two together was really the, the, the next piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. um, but we didn't go crazy on 1160 because yeah. for the most part, that building is, is, is a pretty decent building um, and doesn't need a lot of, um, you know, we could just renovate that building as is mm -hmm. and not change the exterior at all. Mm -hmm. But I think overall, one of the successes of Lexington Partners, if you look at his projects, he does create a sense of community. He does create an environment, especially at the tannery where people you know, really kind of come together. And it's really kind of a, an interesting dynamic um, because there are more renters by choice than ever. Mm -hmm. And they're looking for these unique opportunities where um, they can move into a place that is filled with amenities. It's more of a hospitality feel when you come inside. And so it draws, you know, a unique uh, a resident to a community. Mm -hmm. Listen, I just want to chime in on this because this is very important. Good, yes. There's a lot of people that I compete with that take the same drawings, the same buildings, and they put them out in every community. And it, 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 we've seen it in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. And, and we are really trying each time to sort of mix into the community. And the 1178 building um, was really meant to be something different than the rest of the Silestine Highway. And, and, and we're paying dearly for that. And now we're buying another building so that there are no parking concerns because we do control both so, so, that, so that they sing to each other and they're integrated. And when you look at that community, you don't, it looks like it was always meant to be there, you know, 1160 and 1178 mm -hmm. next to each other. But each one is different. And that costs more. And, but yes. it, 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 it makes a difference. I appreciate that. Okay. Thank you very much. As, uh, as I indicated, uh, part of your regulation provides uh, for the fact that this commission has great flexibility in terms of mixed-use projects uh, in the RC zone. And uh, part of our effort is, uh, as Marty said, to integrate these two properties. And as a result of that, certain waivers uh, are being requested. Uh, with this development, I'm going to ask uh, Kevin Johnson uh, from Post Jensen Miller to come up and uh, walk you through his uh, landscape plan and discuss the waivers that uh, relate to his uh, part of this project. And then I'll discuss uh, a couple of others that um, are also pertinent. Uh, for the record, Kevin Johnson, Close Jensen, and Miller. Uh, you'll recall um, from a previous slide this evening the, the landscape plan that was approved uh, in 2017 for 1178. Basically, it was a pretty intensive landscaping plan for 1178, but on 1160, basically, the landscaping was confined to the entrance drive that we were creating from Mill Street uh, to 1178. So the plan before you this evening is very complementary to 1178, much more intensive. Um, we tried to uh, pull a lot of the same type of plantings uh, that we proposed and incorporated in 1178 with 1160. Uh, when you look at the existing plant material on 1160 today, basically everything around the building is either dying or dead, very poor condition. Same is true in the parking lot. Um, several of the cattle repairs that uh, used to be along Mill Street have died, have been removed. Um, I, think, I think there's still two possibly um, on Mill Street. Uh, there's a grouping of 
uh, I believe it's three or four on the Silas Dean side, as well as one Zelkova. If you look at the placement of those plantings, they're under the power lines, Zelkova's been pruned, there are signs of decay and so forth. So I made the decision to just remove all the plant material on the entire site and just start over again, keeping what was proposed last year as part of that entrance drive, but again, pulling the same type of plant materials uh, that we proposed for 1178, continuing uh, that streetscape, uh, same type of species trees in front of 1160, uh, as well as down uh, the frontage of um, Mill Street. Basically, we're proposing all new plantings, foundation plantings around the building, uh, the islands. Again, everything will be removed. We're proposing all new low uh, ground cover type plantings in the islands, uh, as well as uh, major deciduous trees uh, around the patio area. Again, that's going to be similar to what we were proposing at 1178. Uh, again, low ground cover, evergreen type species, and then some deciduous multi sem trees as well as some evergreens. And the idea there is, uh, again, to provide some buffering um, between the parking area uh, and uh, Silas Dean Highway. So in terms of waivers, and I know you've been waiting to see how many waivers I bring you this evening. <laughs> it's not two pages tonight, I know. No, I think we did pretty good on this one. <laughs> We went landscape on the list. Um, and again, if you recall uh, from the proposal last year, there were several waivers that we requested um, for 1160. Uh, very similar waivers. Um, I'm not going to go into a great detail, um, but basically, um, <coughs> I'm just going to cover uh, the landscape waivers on, on this slide. Um, and Attorney Alter will cover the other waivers. But basically, um, we're required to have 25% of any lot as green space um, on this particular uh, waiver request. We're missing the requirement by 261 square feet. Um, so we're, we're actually very close. Uh, and I think a lot of that um, was the removal of that drive aisle, uh, the former bank drive aisle around the building where we gained green space. Um, the second one is there's supposed to be a minimum of five foot uh, landscaping between property line, side yard, and any part of the parking area. On this particular site, um, the area on the south side of the building by the patio, the little turnaround area we created, uh, we actually have uh, 0.9 feet between the uh, highway street line and the edge of the parking. So we're requesting uh, a waiver of 4.1 feet. And that's the only area on the site where we're not meeting that five foot um, criteria. It's just that backup area. Uh, the loading area, again, Attorney Alter, semi discussed that earlier uh, on the parking lot area. Um, where there are a couple trees that I'm proposing along the side of that on the Mill Street side, side um, of that. Um, it's not screening per se evergreens or dense plantings that you wouldn't be able to see it. Um, but again, there are uh, some deciduous trees there, so we're asking for the waiver for the screening uh, of that area. Waiver of what for that? What, what the are you doing? Waiver of the screening of the loading area. We're not oh, okay. proposing heavy. Looks like you got two or three trees there, yeah. Well, as, as I said, we're proposing some trees, but it's not a dense screening such as arborvitaes or yeah, other. I noticed three conifers. of your waivers are for that particular situation. There. Okay, Mike's my comment. Uh, the fourth landscape waiver, uh, internal, uh, well, we're, we're required to have 15% of the internal parking area as green space. Uh, in this particular situation, uh, we're short by 2,220 square feet. Um, again, that's collectively through the entire uh, parking area there. And the last waiver, um, landscaped islands uh, that are created, they're supposed to have a minimum of 160 square feet and a minimum width of eight feet. We have six islands. Uh, that are less than 160 square feet and six that are less than eight feet wide. Um, 
those are primarily the islands to the back of the building and towards the rear of the site, those skinny islands. So there's only five waivers tonight for that. The um, the other waivers that that I'll mention um, are uh, pointed out by the red arrows that you see on the site plan. Kevin mentioned the uh, turnaround space that the town engineer requested uh, along towards the Silas Dean Highway. Um, in this area, we've added uh, that additional turnaround area, and, and that would require a waiver in order to meet the town engineer's request. This is that loading area that, that we've discussed earlier. Kevin has proposed plantings here uh, and on the other side as well, but it's not as he said, a dense thicket of arbor variety. It's, it's customary landscaping in order to provide a loading area for residents. And then finally, um, we have to have a structure for gas meters. We had we ran into this uh, problem in Glastonbury as well. The Connecticut Natural Gas has its own rules about how gas meters have to be erected. Uh, in, in a situation like this. And in order to satisfy uh, their rules, we have to create a, a structure uh, as defined in your regulations in order to enclose uh, the gas meters uh, within it. And so what we're asking is that... Um, you, you mean this is required by the gas company? Correct. Or in most town regulations? No, it's the just gas. Just here in Glastonbury? It's, no, 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 it's the gas company. The gas company. They tell us exactly Safe. how it's going Safety to be done, issue, yeah. Yeah. and they sure. they aren't particularly concerned about anybody's but zoning regulations. Light structured stuff around them, right? right. Um, and then finally, uh, back sorry, to so where's, the, where's that structure going? It's right in the along the Mill Street you know, boundary yeah. where the the arrow. The arrow. Uh, <coughs> if you look just to the west yeah. of the loading area, there's a a, a little out burst of building to the right of the main building towards Mill Street. What is that what is that structure gonna be? It'll be brick. Like how high? Um five feet. Five right. feet high. Okay. And then uh CNG. we we are asking for uh, a waiver on the building height. Um regulation is forty feet. The existing building is fifty six feet. That's legally existing as a non-conforming building at the present time. But we're asking, based on uh, Matt's design, that you uh, allow uh, an additional three feet for the architectural treatments to create the pediment at the top of the building and to create that architectural interest. As Matt indicated, um, it will still be lower than the 1178 building. It'll step down from 1178. Um, which was uh, the building you approved okay. last year. Um, the low, and Mr. Oikel is correct, the last three waivers all revolve around the, the loading space. We're trying to accommodate residential loading much more than commercial loading, and it needs to be near the building. And um, given the, the present construction of the building between Close Jensen Miller and Matt and, and Marty <coughs> uh, collaborating. They felt that this was very convenient for residents when they have to load or unload materials uh, for their apartments. Kevin felt that he could adequately screen it and, and that it would be the least obtrusive place uh, as it relates to the Mill Street side of the building. But uh, in order and, to and you kind of have to have this. You can't have no, we, vehicles we, parked out on correct. Mill Street. We, we can't, we can't do that. We need a place or where people can, lot somewhere. can operate from, and, and yeah. this seems to be uh, the best positioning for that, but it requires uh, waivers that you would allow it between the building and the street line, 
that you would allow it to be in the side yard, but less than 20 feet from the property line, and that uh, although it's not really a commercial loading space, um, it, it is supposed to be at least 50 feet from any residential use, which, because this is a mixed-use building, really doesn't make any sense. Um, and, and we would ask that it be waived. Uh, we don't think any of the waivers that we're asking for are particularly uh, large or, or are overreaching. It allows us to redevelop and repurpose this building uh, as we've described it uh, through our presentation. A couple other issues that I just wanted to mention at the um, approval of the 1178 project. Uh, Mr. Field, who is the owner of the shopping center where Marshall's and now Pasta Vida is, mm -hmm. expressed some concern that people might decide to park in his parking lot. We agreed with him that we would put a sign in our parking lot that said, that said, we'll say that residents and, and uh, guests of 1160 and 1178 are not invited to park uh, in the shopping center across the street to discourage People Unless from they're buying that, over there. Well, that, if they're customers, that's different. <laughs> I guess they can go into Pasadena and buy something and leave their car there and walk home. Um, but we wanted to reaffirm that we're still committed to uh, that as, as an indication to Mr. Field that we um, don't want to impose on his, his parking area. Um, that was something was discussed at 1178, and uh, we simply wanted to reconfirm that um, that continues to be in order. For, for all of the materials that we've presented to you, um, we think that this is a terrific opportunity for the 1160, 1178 complex to really make a statement on this part of the Silestine Highway. Uh, Marty is very excited about this project. He thinks that uh, it will be as successful as his project in Windsor and his project most recently completed in Glastonbury will be. Uh, he's anxious to move forward. Um, we had been asked about a construction schedule. Um, this is a kind of critical path construction schedule. You'll notice that uh, abatement work for 1178 is to start this month and then the project will move forward. Uh, 1160 will move forward, and if, you, if we can get started on 1160 in a timely way, 1160 will actually be occupied before 1178 will because of the necessity of not only abating 1178, but also of the building demolition, which will slow down the commencement and construction of the rest of that project. So we would ask that, um, the commission, uh, if you have any questions, we're happy to answer them. All of our people are here, uh, ready and willing to answer the questions. There was, at least to our way of thinking, the memo from the town engineer and Mr. Gillespie's memo did not raise any issues for us. Uh, there doesn't appear to be anything outstanding uh, or left to provide to the commission. We think we've given you a complete picture of our project and we would ask that you consider approving it uh, as soon as you can. Happy to answer any questions Great. as uh, all the people who have made Thank you. Very uh, appreciate the thoroughness of the presentation, very good presentation. Have a, we'll open up the questions. Quick question before yep. uh, the attorney uh, departs. Uh, well, I'm not, not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, parts for the podium, excuse me. Um, <laughs> I am just uh, uh, want to make uh, certain in terms of where we stand in terms of your uh, various applications. Uh, we've got both site plan application uh, to approve and also special permits special that permit. would include, you know, uh, all these waivers as applicable. Most of these seem to be, most of the waivers seem to apply to uh, site plan and landscaping plan. Is that correct? I, I, think, I think that's a pretty fair statement. I think yes. everything if, except for the height waiver regulations. And uh, a little gas meter accessory structure, that's correct. That's, that's true. Um, do your site plans that have been, well, site and landscaping plans that have been submitted to the town incorporate 
all of these uh, yes. requirements and waivers? Yes, they do. Do they also include or incorporate the various recommendations uh, that have come down from town staff in their latest uh, submissions to the commission? As far as I know, the only change that has to be made to uh, no, I take that back. On 1160, every, you, you're completely up to date, right? Yes, we're completely yeah, any, up to any, date on seems like any of the <laughs> 1178, we have to eliminate the south driveway right turn out on the plan. Right, and that state. would be essentially a separate application. Correct. Well, I think it's just an administrative change. Or administrative also. change, okay. Yes. Before I take any more questions, I think you know the patient's been very public. It's it's getting late, so it is a public hearing. So if, if there's any comments from the public, uh, please come up now. Come on, come on up. State your name and address for the record. <laughs> Good evening, Tom Mazzarella, 600 Walker Hill Road. A <clears throat> uh, couple comments. Uh, for the record, I'm not a fan of more apartments in Weathersfield. One person, anyways. You are? I'm not. not. I'm not. I um, the plan looks nice, as always. You got the A team here, Mr. Alter, doing an excellent job. Um, I have a couple concerns about the parking, which has been discussed at length. And if you go by the guesstimate of 1.2 cars, um, it looks like there's sufficient overflow. What, what happens if there's not? What happens if they get the number wrong? And uh, Attorney Alter has suggested that no one has more to lose than the developer. It's his project, but uh, we've seen in other areas in town where uh, apartments exist on Mill Street uh, where there's not enough parking and it creates a big problem. Here, it's going to create, if it did occur, it's going to create a bigger problem. Where else can they go? They can go on Mill Street, possibly. They're not going to park on the Silestine Highway. The Marshall's parking lot has a parking situation of their own. Uh, if you've ever gone in that parking lot, there's not very many empty spaces at any time of the day. <clears throat> I also have a concern about the traffic. And we always hear about the traffic studies, um, and there's no significant increase in traffic. Well, you're putting roughly 178 cars onto this proper, these two properties, or this uh, one property. If I figured it right, 1.2 cars per unit. Uh, 150 units combined. So if you're traveling down the Silestine Highway in the afternoon heading north around 4 o'clock, traffic backs up from Maple Street all the way to CVS. There's actually a, a gridlock situation at the traffic light at CVS and, and Maple Street. Now, you're not adding that many more cars, but it's already a bad situation. And we continue to hear of these different developments where it doesn't have any effect on the traffic. I just don't understand how that's possible. You're going to add more cars to town. Uh, yes, you may not have a, a, an actual queuing situation, but the volume of vehicles on the street is going to increase. The volume of uh, cars in town is going to increase. And uh, I think it, that should be considered. Um, I think that was, uh, that was my main point. But for what it's worth, thank you. What do we? What do you? What should we do about it? We should. We should reject this somehow. This uh, 1160. I'm just putting it out there. There's What's 26,000 that? residents in town. There's not any more room. And, no, no. And but, we're uh, gonna we're gonna turn the we, town into a small city. 
and I just don't think that's... It, it, it's an existing building, and something has to go into it, and it's going to be comparable to what they've presented. I mean, maybe apartments a little bit more than if it were left in a more commercial state, but basically, uh, I don't know what you would recommend us to do. Is it that you're, you're making comments, and how do we address them? Do you have a suggestion? Yeah, don't approve the project. Don't approve it. Right. So let the building remain vacant. Yeah. Not taxable. Uh, Commissioner Winkle, well, I think he can state it, his well comments. The, uh, that, the, you know, he's allowed, he's allowed to the, say you know. the equity <laughs> bank building is taxable now. It doesn't matter if it's rented or not. They still pay the same amount of tax. Not necessarily. No. Well, other than personal property, what's the difference? No, still not so. Okay. I appreciate your anyway, comments. So. Okay, thank you. I'm asking, that's all. Thank you. Just, just to clear up something, uh, based on, and Mark, you can correct me if I'm wrong, a actually the residential use produces a lower traffic volume at peak times than if this remained an office building and, and produced a higher peak uh, traffic volume so that uh, Mr. Mazzarella's concern, this is actually an improvement over if this were a fully occupied office building. There is actually less peak traffic than there is, uh, there would be less peak traffic with the residential <coughs> use. Said, correct, Mark? Right. Okay. And um, the, the uh, and, and philosophically, I, you know, this is what I do for a living. I believe in development. I think every community should aspire to have quality development within its boundaries, not only for the tax base, but for the opportunity to provide jobs and to attract more people to live in your town. Um, the, and without beating Marty's drum for the tannery, the opportunity of infusing Glastonbury with 50% of the people who are aged 26 to 40, it, it, we, Glastonbury is an aging community and all of a sudden we have this infusion of young people, it's great. And uh, the demographics of Wethersfield are not terribly different than the demographics of Glastonbury. And when you have opportunities to bring young people into a community, eventually they will not live in apartments and they will look for houses to buy on Beverly Road and on Wilkett Hill Road and uh, up in Pike Park. Wethersfield up here may be a higher elderly population than almost any other town in the region. <laughs> Well, or all the more reason why we should try to attract some young people. At least it used to be. I think it's still is. <laughs> Happy to answer any other questions. Any other questions from the commission? Will that parking lot be repaved? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And yes. If, if this opens up before 1178, will it still be repaved? Yes. At that, that date of 1160 opening, or is it uh, contingent on 1178? I mean, oh, is this a standalone project? It makes sense sometime spring of uh, 2018. That's next, 2019. Spring of 2019. So, so once the, the spring of 2019. So we do a final paving once the project is towards the end. Oh, right, right. I got it. I got it. Okay. Yeah. Doing it before, I think, is just yeah. it's yep. good views. That's makes sense. Any other questions by the commission? Any motions to close? Motion to close. This, 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 this. Yeah. Oh, somebody's waving. I'm sorry. We have a, all right, we have a public comment. I'll, I'll leave it open to public comment. Oh boy. We'll take one last one. Take as many as there are. Gas Col Antonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. I have to say, I, I wasn't here for the whole presentation, but. Uh, and I haven't worked as an engineer for the past 10 years, but uh, you know, just putting something like this on Silestine Highway, a four-lane highway, I don't think the traffic is going to be really uh, affected at all. I mean, it's it's just, uh, uh, you know, four lanes of highway can take quite a bit of traffic, and the way it is now, you know, and the way it would be, I don't think it's going to make any difference. Uh, I also like the idea that you know uh, I can picture the way it is now and the way it would be. I think it's a very attractive. And uh, I think the presentation was very well run. I mean, I, I, it brought me back a lot of good memories. Yeah. <laughs> Yolanda and I used to work together. So, and it's, uh, yeah. thank you, it was good. Great.
Any other comments by the public? Okay, so there is a motion to close. Motion to close. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any motions on the table before we uh, start our discussions? Can't find it. Mr. Chairman, I would uh, move uh, approval of uh, application number 1981-18Z, the Borden Weathersfield LLC, uh, seeking special permit, uh, as well as uh, approval of the uh, site landscaping plans that have been submitted uh, with the following waivers, and I'm essentially quoting from uh, the, uh, uh, this memo dated uh, April 10, 2018, <coughs> that lists the uh, various waivers, starting with uh, uh, section 3.6, Point A point one um, plus waiver uh, from regulation five uh, section five point four point eight point point A point eight uh, as well as the following waivers uh, sections uh, six point one point D point one section six point one point E Point one point small letter B um, waiver six point one point F point one section six point one point G point one section six point one point G point three section six point two point H point two uh, Tom, Tom, you don't have to read it. <laughs> well, I'm, 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 just hold it up to the microphone. <laughs> hold it up to the microphone. Well, there's only two more to go. It's All waivers. Six two J four and six two J six. All right. Any other stipulations? Yeah, there were there were uh, comments from the town engineer. I think four out of the five uh, uh, were agreed to by the applicant uh, on the record. Uh, there were a bunch of comments from from planning uh, department that uh, I'm not sure have been addressed yet. So if you just want to refer to that memorandum uh, in terms of my comments, we covered the waivers, uh, the parking revised parking agreement for the shared parking uh, needs to be reviewed and revised by the town attorney. There was a previous condition and I think it still holds true uh, that uh, we need to review the commercial tenancy. At least the zoning officer does. If he's not comfortable with it, I think the planning and zoning commission should uh, be involved. We need some correspondence from the MDC regarding utility uh, uh, capabilities for the property. And then lastly, similar to the first project, uh, the final details uh, of the exterior improvements need to be reviewed uh, by the Design Review Advisory Committee. I include the comments from the town planner uh, incorporated within the resolution by reference. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> Any discussion? Yeah, I, I guess there has to be one in every crowd, and I'll volunteer. Um, I mean, frankly, I, I liked the pro, the proposal for 1178, and this one just doesn't give me the same feeling. Um, you know, the applicant talked about how the world is better because he controls both sites in terms of the shared parking. Frankly, I think what the engineer has shown is that the shared parking is iffier now than it was before you know when, when this building was was all commercial um you know the the unit mix and the kind of the way they were presented <clears throat> sort of struck me as almost a, a spartan afterthought in terms of you know, being compared to the, you know, the, the kind of high-end stuff that was, you know, sold to us or being marketed at 1178. Um, you know, this looks like you're taking a bank and you're gutting it and breaking it up into, you know, into barracks that are probably smaller than we would allow anywhere else in town if, if you were asking us. Um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're closing the drive-through and that's an improvement and so forth, but 
Well, frankly, I, you know, it doesn't, I, I don't see it as, as being uh, a net plus to the whole <clears throat> project compared to what we had seen a year ago. And I don't have a better crystal ball than anybody else does on what the, you know, what the future of apartment markets in Greater Hartford will be. Um, I know we've approved a lot that are on the drawing board, some that are being built. Um, you know, with all due respect to everybody in town, we aren't Glastonbury. Uh, I don't think the, you know, the demographics here will be the same as, as what they have at the tannery. Um, you know, the, the parking at some of the other places, I think, may be skewed by what the demographics are in those buildings, you know, and that, that wasn't really <coughs> fleshed out. But, you know, while it's, it's not a bad thing, frankly, I don't see it as better than what the situation that already exists. Um, you know, and, and uh, you know, as, as one of the members of the public said, you know, it's, it's, it, you know, it's the kind of thing that if, if the uh, parking doesn't work out, there is no plan B. When we looked at the one at Jordan Lane and Ridge, you know, I think they were below the 1.5 threshold, but they also identified several places where they could add parking if necessary. You know, here that option doesn't exist. So, um, you know, it, it's a situation and the applicant says, you know, it, it's his problem and his reputation if it doesn't work out. Um, but, you know, if it works out for five years, he sells it, and, you know, then it doesn't work out. We're all still going to be sitting here trying to figure out how to deal with it. And, uh, you know, uh, I think we have to look at it from a longer perspective than, you know, how long real estate developers generally hold a project or how long a particular dentist lease is. <clears throat> I respectfully disagree with Mr. Roberts' um, his feeling. I'm, I'm very impressed with the fact that there's an attempt to bring architecturally the two buildings together. Uh, I think it's going to add a plus to um, an old 1980 worn out uh, commercial office building uh, that hasn't been fully rented. Uh, the bank is the main tenant that has moved out. I think this is a wonderful opportunity to uh, develop that piece of property into something modern, useful. Um, I think that the parking studies that have been done, that the engineers did go uh, more than further than they ordinarily would do uh, in searching not only other apartment buildings, but uh, uh, taking the averages uh, and going <coughs> further than the, this, the simple, usual um, mechanisms for, for judging uh, traffic and parking. So I feel very comfortable uh, in, in what, they've, what they've indicated. Um, <clears throat> and as far as the size of the units, uh, at that point I am not a, a real estate entrepreneur. Uh, I do trust uh, the track record of the developer that uh, if the developer thinks that this is going to be a beneficial thing economically for him, um, I'm willing to go for it. Uh, and I think that overall it, it's a plus uh, that we, now we have two renovated uh, structures in town. And uh, I think that's good. Great. I agree with what he's saying. Um, la last week, Money Magazine published that Hartford was 15th in the country for young people to find occupations. Hard to believe, but it was in published. And I think what they've done is they've taken two buildings, one very <coughs> modern and one that is antiquated, combined for residential. The only thing I'm worried about, again, is the restaurant. Please don't put a bar in there where people will, will linger, because I think, I think your uh, tenants won't like that. But I think it's a, I think it's a great uh, effort, and I wish you all the luck in the world. I think if the residents are uh, one quarter, 20 to 35, I think they disagree with you. Um, oh, 21, sorry. To, <laughs> but um, I, I'm in favor of the, of the application. I don't think there's much of a alternative, I guess, 
Um, I can imagine it being there's a CME engineering building that had you know law firm and the engineering offices and others and I remember how packed their uh, parking lots used to get whenever I had to go over there for a meeting and then they left the other law firm left and now it's just vacant and it's been vacant for a couple of years so I, I know it's it seems to be tough to fill those types of buildings in the area and uh, I don't know I think regarding the size uh, a smaller studio is going to be more for the younger more uh, mobile person who's looking just for for something maybe it's short term maybe it's not but for a year to year lease I think it's they're the perfect candidate for it um, so I can see it I could see it filling, and I can see it being like remaining like a high uh, utilization. So, and I also, I, I also don't think the traffic is going to be much of an issue. I realize, <coughs> I realize the concern, but um, and I know the, I know the backup that happens, but that's usually heading north, and this is more of a destination. By then, everybody's heading home, so everybody would be going to there. So they're either heading south or they're stopping right there from the highway. So. Um, I don't know. I'm just in general favor. I don't see anything that's really a red flag other than maybe somebody trying to steal the TV from the patio in the middle of the night. Yeah, I, I see Commissioner <laughs> Allard, absolutely. I mean, traffic, I don't believe, is going to be a concern. Uh, parking, I am a little concerned about parking, but I, I, I trust that the developer will implement uh, any kind of management practices to make sure the traffic is not an issue. I think it's a great investment for the town. Obviously, you know, uh, this, this building, or at least the adjacent 1117, has been empty for uh, a decade or so, so I think the investment is a good thing for the city of Weathersfield, town of Weathersfield. <clears throat> uh, overall, I am in favor of it. It, does, it also meets the uh, 510D special permit criteria. There's nine criteria. I think it certainly meets those criteria, so overall, I am in favor of the project. So, um, in, in conceptualizing uh, moving the, the resolution, I did have some of the concerns that, that uh, Commissioner Roberts uh, articulated most particularly the, the unit size of the studio apartments but since Weathersfield doesn't have a, a standard for that um, I'm, you know, I certainly wouldn't impose my, my judgment on that, <coughs> that kind of score um, and when you look at the proposal uh, in its entirety and, on, and balancing all the various considerations I think the balance leans toward you know, approval of the application as opposed to opposing it. Any other comments? All right, let's take it to a vote. All in favor? All right. Aye. Thank you. All right. Any opposed? All opposed? Motion passes. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Good luck. Good luck, <laughs> <laughs> Move on to. Uh, other business. Oh, we'll take a two minute break. With yeah. Yeah. I'll let you. Uh... Yeah, break is good. <clears throat> take a one minute break. All right, we'll take, we'll take a couple minute break. Tom missed a good one, huh? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, somehow oh, that and I got the subject I know the most break. about. Oh, okay. That's what they said. Take breaks. That's not a break. So whatever you need. Yeah. Yeah. Eric, Eric and stretch. Rick and the yeah. school. That's the best Seventh one. Seventh and stretch. And I, I didn't I respond quickly enough to the email saying, no, I don't want to be part of this. We've been doing a lot of ours as like punch things. 
Um, well, it still doesn't get you there. I just find the ethics. Turn that one off. Is it written in your eyes? <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> I was like, yes, what's yeah. the. Told me about three days ago. And she says, We'll have to go there when I come down. I said, I didn't know it was open. Is it? In the daytime, huh? it did. It's, it opened for yeah. uh, for dinner. It's I open know, for dinner now. It was on the TV or something. My daughter found it up in the uh, riverfront. Yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. I didn't know it was a uh, I'm going to call the meeting back to order. Uh, with respect to the the other application, can we make a motion to move to application 6.1, 1896, Lucas? Karyakos, uh, Lucky Loose. Motion to move out of order. So move. Second. All right, so I'm going to call application number 1896 16-7. So, Chair, Mr. Chairman, just for the record, it's, not, uh, it's an application number. It's not an application pending that you requ are required to vote on. It's on your agenda uh, as a requirement of the conditions of approval you granted back in February of 2006. One of those conditions was that um, staff provide you with an annual report of uh, compliance with the conditions of approval. So uh, I did prepare for you, and it's dated today. I apologize it didn't get in your packets on Friday, but I did uh, provide you with a memo and uh, a series of attachments related to that memo. 
regarding the various conditions of approval. Uh, in summary, um, the primary condition of approval dealt with the uh, music, uh, the band, and the associated noise levels uh, of the activity. Uh, part of the packet of information that you received was a, a call log report that the Weathersfield Police Department provided to me. Uh, in summary, uh, the report, um, obviously specific to this address at 222 Main Street, uh, during the calendar year 2017, there were 14 uh, loud music complaints received. Uh, the first complaint started uh, May 27th, and the last one was filed on October 7th of 2017. Um, in summary, uh, of the 14 calls received and investigated by the Weathersfield PD, uh, 12 can generally be characterized as, uh, in terms of the officer who provided the report, either all quiet, no violation, low volume, or by the time they got to the address, the band had already stopped playing, so they could not uh, confirm whether there was a violation of the noise ordinance. Uh, however, there were two calls uh, above and beyond those 12 uh, that could be classified as follows. The first one was June 29th, which was a Thursday night. Uh, there was a meter reading taken at 26 Marsh Street, which is the adjoining property, at 9.33 p.m. and the decibel levels uh, were recorded and measured <coughs> at 74. Uh, the officer uh, instructed the management to turn the music down. Uh, they complied and the follow-up readings were within acceptable uh, range. Uh, on July 28th, which was a Friday night uh, at 9.16 p.m., there was a, a call made. Uh, the officer uh, appeared on site and, and immediately instructed the staff to turn the music down. Uh, and this was at 9.32 p.m. Um, at that point in time, the background noise uh, was already registering 55 decibel levels without the music playing, uh, which exceeded um, the uh, ordinance limits. Uh, when the band resumed playing, the readings were taken at 65 to 68 decibel levels. So there were two instances of, of those 14 that were confirmed by the police department to be uh, in uh, excess of the noise levels. Uh, some of the other conditions that uh, during this past year that we had to uh, work on with the applicant was um, there was a condition that a, a tree buffer planting plan uh, be provided and approved by town staff. Um, there's correspondence in the packet of information from the zoning officer that was sent to the owner regarding that uh, effort. Uh, there was also correspondence from the applicant's attorney in response to that. Uh, in summary, uh, in early July, there were a series of arborvitae uh, planted uh, to, to address uh, that particular condition. Uh, I have to note that as of today, it looks like some of those have, are on the way, to, uh, on the way out uh, or need to be replaced. So uh, that's going to be a, an issue that we bring to the applicant's attention. And then um, lastly, uh, as a result of the July 28th um, call to the site, uh, the officer uh, <coughs> who responded um, talked to the police chief. Police chief then talked to the town attorney. There are provisions in the noise ordinance that um, factor in background noise. And in those cases, when the background noise exceeds the, the, the standard decibel levels, there's an additional five decibel levels permitted in certain situations. In essence, at the end of the day, instead of a normal 55 decibel reading, uh, in those situations, the reading can go up to 60 and not be a violation of the ordinance. So um, there are all of the associated attachments uh, in this memo uh, for your uh, Information. I don't know that I need to get into, uh, you know, there's a photo of the plants that were planted. Uh, there's a uh, email from the town attorney regarding the issue of the increased decibel readings. And then obviously there are the uh, police call log reports. So um, I think both of the, uh, uh, the applicant's attorney is here tonight uh, if there are questions uh, or, or concerns. And then additionally, for those of you who've been on the commission, uh, we have had a neighbor on Marsh Street who has um, been impacted by the noise 
um, and she is here tonight as well as her attorney. So um, I have been in communication with both of them over the last few weeks regarding this annual report. Uh, it was going to be on an ag earlier agenda, but because of the previous agendas, we've sort of pushed it along. So they are both with you tonight. So uh, since you're here, would you like to speak? Good evening, and it's a late evening at that for you. Fatima Loba representing Lucky Lou's. I've been before you before. Um, I've reviewed the memo which sets forth um, a lot of information. As for the issue of the arborvitaes that haven't made it through this winter, as you may all know, uh, Lucas takes very much care with all the plantings on the property and the aesthetics of uh, landscaping. So when that happens, now that finally it appears that we get, we are having spring, it's been a little bit delayed, um, he will replace those as part of the landscaping that he does on the property. Um, I did review the documents, and it's interesting, but you know, to me, not surprising that 13 of the complaints were by Ms. Zapala, who is here tonight. This has been a kind of an ongoing issue. Um, since I was here before, I haven't received any calls other than from now uh, Mrs. Zapala's counsel. Um, and I actually spoke to Attorney Donahue uh, last week. And, you know, uh, Attorney Donahue even expressed a concern, and we have had such bad weather. Actually, the first day that we actually had outdoor music was on uh, May 22nd on a Sunday. And in response to Attorney Donahue indicating to me that um, Mrs. Zappella's daughter was unable to go to sleep that night, I inquired of my client what had occurred on that date. And according to the records, and they can be verified, there was a jazz band, We Three, from 4 to 7 p.m. on Sunday. That has been the first time we've had it, and it appears that we are here again with complaints. Uh, she has filed 13 of the 14 complaints that are before you. Um, we have had no other indication from anyone else. There's no one that was indicated as anonymous. Obviously, we don't know who that is. We d we've been trying to remedy these issues, and the memo really points out as, as it relates to the July 28th incident, the, the conditions that exist at the site, which is without any, anybody playing, it can be at 55 decibels. And as we discussed before, one of the issues is when the web barn has an event and they're outside, that triggers us, our reading to be higher. It's the situation that exists by virtue of the web barn being there, noise and, and traffic. And we continue to be dedicated to trying to minimize the impact in the community. Uh, we were just voted best outdoor dining. I think that's a plus for Weathersfield uh, in Hartford Magazine. Um, Attorney Donahue indicated to me that he wanted to, hi he was hiring an expert, and I offered, I said, if you can make it happen, we'll meet with, with you at the patio to, to see if there's anything we can do. I mean, I won't rehash, especially in the lateness of the hour, how many different ideas we went through last time, and um, the plantings was where we ended up being. Obviously, as they grow, they'll provide more, more buffering, and like I said, we will replace them. We continue to be committed, and even when Lucas was here, and because I knew it was going to be late, uh, he could not be here today because he was closing the restaurant, and I was aware that there was a lengthy um, presentation before us. But even uh, back when we were before you, he indicated to Ms. Zapala, if you call me and you say, it's loud, I'll, I'll try to react to it. Uh, this, this idea that, we, that there's a call, 13 calls to the police, all of this impacts not only the police and having to come out there, but it impacts my client's business. Mm -hmm. People are not comfortable when the, the police comes to the restaurant. We can all figure out what that effect is. I don't think I have to say it. It's not a good thing for business. 13 calls. There was one, one that was anonymous. That is the sum total. There was one that said cars parked on the lawn. So there was that one, but I don't think that we're here on that. Um, we remain committed to trying to, to do whatever we can to be good for Weathersfield, to, to be a good business, a business that the town can be proud of. But I stand here and I, you know, I feel like it's, I'm a broken record from last time. I will take any questions that you have. Uh, so like a, like a full patio, do we have a base level decibel of? 
Well, here's, what here's did a lot of people on the patio in the middle of the day. Was that was that the 50 or? The July 28th incident, the, the band wasn't playing and it was 55. 55. I, I was curious if the had the like background that. noise is actually from the interstate. Oh, okay. All right. I was just curious if we had like, here's what it is if there's a bunch of people, no music. But all right. Just curious. That's a good question, actually. Uh, but I do not know the answer <clears> to that. Yeah, I just don't know what the... I'm assuming that it indicated some level because when the police was called on the 28th, the, the patio did have people. It's just that the band wasn't playing at that time. Yeah, I mean, that's what readings are tough anyway because they're weird. Wind and exponential and stuff. So, right. all right, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good late evening. TJ Donahue from Killian and Donahue. I represent Maria Sapala, who was here today. She's a woman who's lived in Marsh Street for 22 years. Uh, she does not want to stop the music. She wants to be a good neighbor. Over the last years, she's had 100 complaints in because of excessive noise. The noise is clearly excessive. You'll find Mr. Gillespie's report clearly indicates that they're in violation of your conditions for your special permit for them for that music. She would like the music to play at 55 degree decibels and no more. And you can see that there were clear readings last year of the 14 stops of decibel readings up to 69, 74 degrees. We don't have much time tonight. We believe that we are very disappointed in the police officer Gonzalez and the whole town and your town council who gives a secret and confidential email message making an opinion and a finding that the, ter that the permanent total condition of the I-91 corridor is 55 decibels as measured from our house. That's absurd, it, it just is not, and they've used that as a blanket standard to try to get them so they can go to 60 decibels. All they've tried to do over the years is push it to the maximum limit, and all Marie Sapala wants it to do is to stay within the 55 and lower decibel region, and we think it's a responsibility of this board and the condition of your special permit to pay some attention to that. She's not some crazy person making noise. Can you clarify, of the 14 you're saying just one violated the Decibel, right? No. Uh, and let's take a look a at, uh, at your staff's at, at your staff's. Let's take a look at your staff's report. The fourth paragraph: music band noise levels. He says, of the 14 calls received and investigated by the Weathersfield Police Department, 12 can be categorized as all quiet, no violation, okay, low volume, or the band had already stopped playing. That that mischaracterizes the subsequent uh, sheets that you'll find in sheets. Uh, <clears throat> If you follow the track of the sheets of the Weathersfield Police Safety Log, you will see that that's a little bit fast with what really happened. You can see the report on uh, June 29th, decibels at 74 decibels, no ticket. You'll see the report on July 28th, the reading was 65 to 68, nothing done. You'll see the report on uh, On August 13th, the police did nothing. She had her own decibel reading, and that was 65 decibels, and they, they didn't even measure it. On oh, excuse me, what does that mean? Your she client, has a, she, my she has client has a decibel meter. Reader, now, meter. your noise ordinance has very clear specifications as to how it has to be used, how it has to be calibrated, what the reports have to be. And of course, when we get the report from the, from the town council that they're going to get a bonus of an extra five decibels by reading the highway. Okay. He says he refers to some <coughs> report email that he got from Officer Gonzalez. That's not there. Nothing's there. It doesn't tell us when they measured the highway, what the highway had to do with. So there are standards for measurement in your noise regulations. This commissioner said that that's a very difficult thing to measure, and it's, it's, it's very difficult to measure, and, it's, it, and the noise is a very difficult thing to enforce. But in this situation where you have a residence so close and, and the clear conditions of your special permit that he stay under 55 decibels, I think that you've got to enforce that. Or we have to try to find what other alternatives we could to enforce it. But it makes a material difference on Maria and Sapala and her daughter's life. And, uh, and it's been ongoing for a long, long time. And it's... it's uh, Lucky Lou is a successful restaurant op uh, 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 entrepreneur. I've been there. He runs a good establishment. 
But like anybody at night, he pushes the limit on that band every night, especially when it's crowded. It gets louder and louder until 11 o'clock when it shuts down, and it's, and it's beyond the limits of your permission. It's beyond the limits of your special permit to operate. Um, and and have the, has the landscaping helped? The landscaping was, uh, I haven't seen the landscaping, so I don't know if it's short or, or I how, would be how very pleased. Uh, the commitment was that they would that they would have a landscaping plan, a mitigation landscaping plan approved by town staff that would have a meaningful mitigation attempt. If you could do one thing, please drive in the backyard and look at the look at the yeah, arbor yeah. vitaes that they put there that are happening. They do dead. grow fast though. Arbor vitaes grow fast. Sprinkle just... them with some manure, would you? <laughs> they're not they don't do they, they're not doing it. They they're they're not big enough, they're not in the right spot. Uh, they could put they could put a sound barrier in there, and to add insult to injury to a, to a, a lovely 22 year old resident, the building is owned by the town, leased to the historical society, and then subleased to Lucky Lou. I mean, it's not like you have some independent merchant there. The town has some responsibility here. Who planted the uh, arborvitae? I'd have to ask Miss Lobo. My client. Um and I don't know exactly who from the town. They went out, they looked where to the plant them. The town did it? No, no, no. The town told them, told my client where to plant them and he planted them. Did they tell them how high or how they big told they were to be? They told them exactly what to plant and where and he planted it. And uh, George they just so tall? <coughs> I mean, and how tall were they? They're probably <laughs> as tall as I am. George, uh, <laughs> sure. we, I don't know. we really? got the town tree warden to come out to the site give us a recommendation on where best to plant these. Um, if you're familiar at all with the property, there are some, there, there literally is no buffer along the property line. That was the first. Correct, hasn't um, been for many years. No. He has a garden uh, adjacent to the uh, elevated patio. Um, there are the tree of some significance there. So the root system is there. There's some low growing vegetation. Um, the agreement was to get them as close to the source of the music as possible, um, which is adjacent to the patio, to try and control it at the source. Putting it farther away from the patio, by the time the sound gets there, it's dispersed. It doesn't really have an impact. I, I don't disagree that the arborvitaes that are there now, at this point in time, will have no impact on the noise. Um, you did not attach a condition regarding a noise barrier. You attached a condition regarding a tree a buffer so um so at the end of the day that was the only location okay, and so uh, whether it's had an impact i think is who, who planted them and uh, the, 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 them? lucky lou hired a contractor to do that yeah and was it supervised by us in any mm -hmm. way we came back out and inspected them afterwards and told them specifically i think they were six foot at planting time so uh, i think there were 14 of them at the time they were planted so uh, as I noted, some of them so have died or are in the process of dying and have to be that replaced. Happens in the first year, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. They usually get a year warranty, so I mean, it's not uncommon. So, no, no. If I, Attorney Donahue, my recollection is your client is two houses down Marsh Street. There's a multifamily, and then your house, That's I believe. Correct. And, and to clarify that, the other house is owned by a trust of which the trustee is, is Peter Alter. Yes. It has four uh, tenants in it. Peter Alter expressed to me today by, and authorized me to tell you it hurts him renting the property and his tenants complain about the noise all the time. He's spoken to us in the past, and I recall you speaking in the past about how your daughter, I think, during exams had to go someplace else to study. But one, one question for you. When your client measures, is she measuring at her property line or the restaurant's property line when you get? She, she, she's entitled to sure. measure. Okay. Uh, I mean, I th right. I mean, I think I'm not sure if the ordinance. Uh, so, so this has been an issue with yeah. the ordinance. So I only got a decibel reader because of the police, and they're not. They don't have it a lot of times. So, and sometimes they'll tell me it's different than what it is. So mine is very similar to what they have, um, and, and most of the times it will line up if they show me what they've gotten. But um, in this. 
<coughs> but if you yes, where are you measured from? For, so I've been measuring from my property, and that is where the police have been measuring up until the last couple of months of last year. And then they did, Peter did work with them, and it was straightened out so that they would measure at the property line of the restaurant. Which is, I think, at least right. what the ordinance yes. that's on our right. packet says, right. Right. So the majority of the reading in 2016 were at my property line. They were not at the restaurant. And they were line. exceeding at yeah. your property line. Right. They were exceeding at mine. And, and right. like, you know, Mr. Donahue said, I mean, a lot of them are well above 55. Right. And the other thing I will just say since I'm up here is the trees that were planted are probably three and a half feet tall. So there was no real attempt to make any kind of a buffer there yeah. for me. I might, may I just offer a couple observations? Um, and again, I think we need to try to find something that's workable for everybody. But mm -hmm. frankly, I think this lady, you know, she's, she happens to be close. I, so I think if I lived that close and I heard it, I'd call 14 times. I don't, I don't think we should be uh, impugning her for, for voicing her her uh, the impacts to her I think we should look at it try to figure out if it's in compliance or not and I guess the other thing we don't have the officer's email but I you know as I'm reading this just based on a sketchy summary it would seem to me if you're going to up the standard because of background I, I think you would need to do it on a case-by-case -case basis if at 11 o'clock on a Saturday the background is 55, you can go to 60, but if at a different day, same time or different time, it's not at 55, I don't think you can go to 60. So I don't, I, I'm not the sure. Real, the real right. damage of the, of the supposition that you could give a blanket reading that's permanent for the highway is, it makes to a resident seem like the town is against them. And again, I'm not an expert on this ordinance, but it just strikes me you're looking at background at the time that you're taking the reading to measure whether there's a violation, not saying from here on in for the next 10 years, we'll assume background is, is always 55 because I think it can change. That, could, and, that, that, and, that would be the only possible legal interpretation is your interpretation. I, I guess the other thing is I looked through all those reports too. And, and, and again, I mean, I think there's a variety of factors going on. Sometimes it was 45 minutes until the reading was taken. I, I guess I, <clears throat> I just think it warrants further exploration to try to figure out a way to solve it. And I, and I would also think that when there's 85 people talking on the patio you know with no music that probably adds to the to the background as well but i can't also so. stress enough though that when the web you know uh, the um web barn has an event outside That's they right. are causing additional no decibel levels from their events that when you measure them at the at our property line you're getting Though that I, noise also, I, I, I would. It's, there is. A, I mean, we talked about it last time. There was. That's part of the difficulty. Well, I, I would agree with you. That could certainly probably contribute. But I guess I'm questioning whether that's the case in all 14 that's, examples that's a, that there was an. The event webhouse at the is so web irrelevant. Part. I would like to stress to, to the commission. I'm sorry it's so late. She doesn't want to stop the music. She has no complaint. They use all the time when there isn't live music. They use a sound system out of the deck. She never has a complaint with that. She, she abides that. She has no problem with that. It's when the band gets going, and then it gets going later and later, and they push it harder and harder. But they are in violation of the special permit you gave them all the time because they push it to the limit. And all we want is for them to stay at that 55 level, which they it, should stay at, so and get rid of the nonsense about the highway background. So, uh, go, go ahead. ahead. Well, my question was, um, the question I had was, you mentioned that Mr. Lucas, I forgot his last name, um, offered to, like, you know, he, he asked that, that Mrs. Sapala, Ms. Sapala call him if, she, if he thinks the music is too loud. So what I'm, for me, it would be easier for me to just call someone rather than call the police. That's just me. You know, I've never called the police. So my question is, have you ever tried <coughs> to just call call the, the restaurant person and say, hey, you know what, this is too loud. Can you, can you push it? I have. Actually, Peter witnessed it the year before. We had a meeting. We talked about it. Um, I agreed to do it. Lucas gave me his phone number. 
And I actually did call him when it got out of control. And his message to me, and I have text messages that are in the record from last year, where he told me that I was being ridiculous and it was too bad. And that was also the year that I had to the following weekend. My daughter was in finals. I had to, the music was so loud, and his text message said to me, well, wait till you hear the band next weekend if you think this is too loud. And my daughter had to go to Glastonbury to a Barnes & Noble to study <laughs> because it was a Saturday night and the library was closed. I'm talking more recently, last year, when, since we were here. We went through this. Peter okay. and I went through this with right. you. Um, on this issue of pushing it to the limit, it makes no sense that my client is doing that. First of all, if ever, anybody knows how the patio is laid out, if you play it too loud, then the people closest to can't hear them. So it is balancing, and we tried to keep it within the 55 decibels, and we didn't even know. I, I've not seen the email that everybody's referring to. It wasn't in the pack, and I don't know about this whole that uh, Attorney Donahue has an issue with. Are you at the, are the, you at the bar? Do you help with the music level? I've been there. I've been there, so the idea that you're pushing it to the level that, that it's in my client's best interest for his business to play it louder and louder when you have people sitting right there is just kind of like, it, it, it's fantasy in that my client is trying to do that because at the end of the day, if he does that, he loses half the patio because they're going to be like, it's too loud. Let me, let me, let me just interrupt for one second. This, to me, this commission, we are not in the police business and we can't police what goes on on a Friday and Saturday night at Lucky Lou's. As far as I'm concerned, we need to rely on the Wethersfield Police Department and the information that we receive from the Wethersfield Police Department. If you have a problem with the police department, I think you have to deal with the police department. But I am not going to interject my feelings against that of the Wethersfield Police Department. And if the Weathersfield Police Department, as far as I'm concerned, thinks it's under control, I really have to listen to them, give them credibility. That's not their position. And that's not your position. You're here tonight because you have a responsibility of an annual report on your special permit, and the, the, your, your agent tells you that they're not in compliance. That's why you have to do it. But I need to hear from the police department before I am going to... The police reports are in the packet. Read it. And, and I have two, two they're, they're, readings over level. I mean, the, that's what I have. The reality I have two is readings my, over level according to what I'm reading here. That's it, not in compliance. Well, that's a, it's substantial compliance. I don't think this, the intention was that any, any time you, if my client went over 55 decibel levels, he loses his permit. That, it, that is not the intention of the, of the regulations or any of that. The, the police department gets called. They go out there. They, can, they, they have all the authority they have to deal with it. There have been 100 complaints over the last seven years. They don't change. They've done it. There, can I, so can I just can I interrupt for a second and just say I think we do have an annual report and I do think it's within our purview and role to express you know we, we, I think we can express at least I will express that I would like to make sure that the police and the town officials are accurately measuring and no and problems. and investigating and determining and, and I have some concerns just again, based loosely on what I've read as to whether it has been accurate at the right time, promptly, and measured within accord of the noise ordinance. And I think that is our proper role to suggest that that be done and that to the extent the parties can work together cooperatively mm -hmm. to try to address some of these concerns, that that be done as well. The police department, I have no objection. I agree with, with, with my fellow commissioners, although we can't make a determination based on this information so far. The 14 complaints, two are clearly in, in violation, but the remainder 12 are still suspect. So, I mean, tonight, I, I certainly can't make a, a, uh, an opinion that, that, that they are in violation based on the information I have available. I don't know what my fellow commissioners think, but um. can I nerd out for a second? Um, the so the decibel readings that we're talking about are are from either the property or a police officer unit that's in the your property's driveway, right? The regulation requires I, that you measure at the prop at the emitting property line. At the and that's what the police do. The, sure. at the complainant's no, property the or. Sound of oh, at there, so, um, so I mean, applying the background noise, I, I understand the science of the the five decibel permissible above because they're not they're not additive. Like if you had two 
50 decibels, it doesn't equal 100 because everybody would die. But if you would get like 55 or something like that because they would, there'd be some. And are we measuring like these instantaneous, like what, what are they doing? Are they, are they sitting there for 10 minutes measuring and then they average it or something? Or if somebody rolls no, by I, the... If you look at some of the reports, they provide a range that it went okay. from 65 I, to 68. I, so I there's, saw the levels, I just didn't quite... And, that, or, and I think the other ones are the max levels that they recorded during that. But except, we, that except that in determining the background noise, they have a responsibility to, have, to give 90% of a number of readings to establish that the background noise okay. is the background noise. All so right. that has a different requirement than the other according to your regulation. And that's all from like on the property line of Lucky Lose. Mm -hmm. So it's clear we have to reestablish our protocol in terms of how we're reading these. I mean, I think that's that what is, I mean is I just want to make sure that we're not No, I I think there was a problem with the police department reading them several houses down at, at at Mrs. Paula's property line rather than at the property line of Lucky Lou's parking lot and the residential property. I think that has been corrected and I think the majority of the uh, readings that were done last year uh, reflect that now. I can't speak to the background you know, measurements and how they arrived at all that. Uh, uh, I won't try to, but hmm. I think uh, the problems initially were corrected based on a conversation I had with the chief and, the, and reading the ordinance. So I think... Uh, the recent readings have been in compliance with how they should be measured by the ordinance. Okay. For us, it's very helpful that you'll take this seriously and look at it seriously. We have a neighbor who has a legitimate concern. I did talk to Attorney Lobo about engaging Bob Serio, an acoustical engineer who's going to go out there and see if there's a mitigation strategy that might work, and she did express a willingness to go meet with me on the premises. But it's very important for Ms. Sapala to know that you're going to look at this and that you're not just waving at it in this circumstance. She, she has a real issue. I hope you'll look at the arborvitae that they planted. I hope you'll, uh, and, and Attorney Lobo is very articulate and very uh, convincing. For example, she wrote this to, to town staff last year. Furthermore, now that the cool, wet spring has turned into warmer weather conducive to a robust business at a restaurant and patio, patio, there has been little time for our client to focus on and complete a plan worthy of submission to the town. And that was her discussion about the arborvitae that maybe you go out and take a look at. That's the, that's the robust, proper plan for the town. I, I wouldn't, if, if you've both expressed a willingness to go out there with the expert, I think that would be a great thing to do. So. I'm, I, I'm waiting. But, but I also think that, this is my opinion, that I'm not an attorney. I, I think, yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I think that if you take a lot of the stuff and the history out of it, the bottom line is that we have two neighbors here. One has a business, one is a resident. There was a decision made that a 55 decibel level was reasonable for both parties, for your client, for the resident, for, for the board. That was agreed. So I'm going to assume that everybody's trying to comply with that. I'm going to assume that. <laughs> but that means that when a resident calls the, the, the restaurant person, your client, and, and, and complains, just as it was discussed at a meeting, I would expect out of respect that that person um, complies with that. I Do you agree with that? Absolutely. And I'm not, I'm not clear what text she's referring to and if they were before when I was here last or since. So I am unclear, so I, I can't speak to that. But I would certainly speak to my client if that occurred. That's not we nice, here. right? That's this very is, disrespectful. It is. It is probably. And whether it's true or not, yeah. bottom line is it's disrespectful. Yeah. Correct. And at, this other, at the other point, with, the, with this 55 decibel level, you know, and, and you're measuring it, whether it's 55 or 56, at what point do you call the police? Is it at 56? <coughs> and how, a, how do you calibrate this? She has a decibel reader, and she does not complain if it's, if it, if it's 55 or lower, period. She accepts how about 56? That. 
Okay. But okay. just just well, to I, be clear, I thought she's measuring two properties away right. at her own property line, meaning it's got to be, be considerably that, higher at the source. But wouldn't that be less if it's at her property? If it's, wouldn't your it, decibel level, if you're problem. measuring at your property, yes. isn't that loudness less? If it's a violation at right. her property, so, it has to be a larger violation at the source and, under the ordinance. Was and then, hard. you know, maybe 55, maybe 53 is good enough for everybody on the patio. I don't know what it means, actually, but what the... We discussed this last time, that you can get a decimal reading that's a spike just by, like, okay, like a short period of time on any given yes. instrument. Yes. I think it was that gentleman that kind of knows, I think it was you that brought it up. Like, it's not a, a perfect science. Technically, if, if a car backfires at the time, it will spike it. So there's spikes. Whether so, we do at 50 or 55, it just will do that. Music is not... If I could make a suggestion here, I know you, you uh, identified you want to meet with, with, the, with the other applicant, with the attorney. Maybe we can do that. Also, maybe with staff present, and then we can re-meet after that conclusion of that meeting. With the, I think with the engineer, you mean? Engineer? With the acoustical engineer, because I think there's a good faith effort that we want to see from Lucky Lou's uh, to try to yeah. resolve this again. I have no problem with this. Yeah. That, you know, we'd, be, from, we'd be pleased with that result. Uh, my, my indication to Attorney Donahue is to make it happen before this meeting, we'd make ourselves available. And, if I, and it just if didn't happen. Town staff can be there as well just to help mm -hmm. uh, we'd appreciate facilitate that. that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that. The acoustical equipment comes from each traveling band, right? Yeah. It's not, you have it. So basically, why doesn't Lucky Lose understand from an engineer, acoustical engineer, where to place the equipment so it bounces away from her house in the residence. It's and then I know for a fact yeah, you can buy acoustical shells or acoustical blankets and put up a, a banner line to bounce everything off. What you're doing is then saying we're going to bounce it the other way. And this is, we brought this up. I don't know if, I don't you, have you a put recollection. It of, your building in the Main Street. And what Mrs. Apollo said, well, that's fine because they're renters. So you, if you bounce it, you bounce it somewhere. That's what we, this is the discussion we had last time. That is my recollection. So I will stick by my recollection of what was said. Um, it's all, it's in that corner. It has been in that corner by the parking lot. I'm assuming you're familiar with the layout of the of the patio. But does it does it go straight to your building and bounce off your building? It bounces. It bounces. I mean, I, I'm, I'm assuming the the sound goes everywhere. There's a building right next to it that the town owns. There's people that live there. We're not aware of any complaints. All due from respect, no one's an expert here. There's like an acoustical engineer. Correct. I used to be in a band. I know there's a way to do this. Uh, I can tell you there is a way to do this. So let's get, get that expert. I would like you, know, you guys can meet with the town staff and, and hopefully resolve that uh, and come back to the commission. Hopefully we resolve it. But you know, we do hear your complaints. We're, we're not just uh, not listening to you, but they're also listening to Lucky Lose, and hopefully we we'll come up with a good uh, you know, solution that everyone's happy with. I am encouraged by the fact that you, you have you know, some intent or plans to meet with Cusco engineer because in my experience in real estate development, these these kinds of issues can only really be resolved satisfactory by uh, an, an, an engineered, uh, you know, an engineered solution, if you will. So, you know, I, I, I would encourage you to go through that process and, uh, you know, and hopefully that will resolve the issue on behalf of both parties. Great. We'll reach out to I'm assuming Mr. Gillespie to to schedule something mm -hmm. once you have availability. Good idea. And Mrs. Sapala, have you have you ever eaten at uh, Lucky Lou's like on the patio when the band is playing? Have you ever gone there when there is the band playing? Might be nice if you did. <laughs> Whether she does or not, it's one of the best patios in Connecticut. I got that. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Where are we, Peter? Minutes. Other, yeah, let's go to the minutes. <laughs> minutes are fine. I make a motion to approve, Mr. Chairman. The second. If he says they're fine. So. <laughs> all, all I'm favor. abstaining. I'm abstaining. I have to abstain. Right. Abstain. Right. Motion is passed. What else do we have here, Peter? So the uh, application for the country club has been withdrawn there we did receive a letter from the country club withdrawing that application i believe the neighbor and the country club have come to uh, a resolution that those will be taken down and then at your next meeting 
Um, you will have your application for medical marijuana dispensary facility. Our phone lines have been very busy on that application. Uh, just so you know, the notice to the neighbors was uh, incorrect and had to be re resent and the hearing moved out. So. That's it. Motion to adjourn. So we'll motion. Motion. All, right. All in favor? Aye. 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 How about it from the record books, huh? 11 o'clock. Thank you.